Cooper takes the riders away from Bourgoison, which is at the foot of the Alpe d'Huez. And immediately as they come out of the starting gate, there is the first outside categorized climb of the day, the Col du Glandon. It's a very long climb. Down into the valley of uh, Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne and over the Col de la Madeleine, which is also outside categorization. It's a beast of a climb. The Olympic Games from Alverville see the sprint point before the final climb of the day, the Col de la Croix-Frie. If we look at the profile, well, if you get out of bed in the morning, you see the storm clouds in the sky. This is going to make you fear and trepidation creep into your heart. But that final climb of the day, Phil, the Col de la Croix-Frie, that's where I think we'll see the real action come. All right, Tom, well, back to you. Here's your doll and Izagir about to top out on the first climb of the day. And you can see the rain coming down. That will certainly be a factor on the descent as they prepare for the next climb. They continue to come. Remember, there are five major climbs today, but there you see your two-man break, two minutes up on the chase group, and then six minutes up on the peloton. want to revisit the sky situation one more time, and maybe I just want to stir the pot a little bit, but 200 Swiss francs, which translates to about 106 U.S. dollars, the penalty for uh, Richie Port and Chris Froome. I'm thinking a Sky Cycling kit costs a lot more than that. <laughs> You're right. I think that's uh, uh, less than their shoelace budget per day <laughs> during the Tour de France. Uh, be that it may, the 200 Swiss francs, that's, uh, you can just throw that out the window. The 20 seconds is, is a little bit more compelling. Uh, whether or not that's uh, an accurate assessment right. of what disadvantage they would have had had they not gone back broken the rules and given Chris a little bit of nutrition before the finish line, I think that uh, 20 seconds, I think that the Sky guys will be pretty happy that the penalty was so lenient. In, in your opinion, as a former pro and someone who's raced this before, did, should they tack that on and make it a little more heavy? Uh, yeah, definitely. That could have been a two-minute difference, right. maybe more. So uh, it's not it's not uh, unfair to say that it should have been should have been uh, more rider hate at all. Attacking here for the king of the mountain points. This is an HC climb beyond category, so a lot of points in the competition. Izagiri second on that, and chasing behind is his teammate Mikel Nieve. And he's actually in the king of the mountain jersey, even though he does not lead that competition. He's in the next group out on the road, trying to get some KOM points for the uh, uh, teammate of Izagiri there on the Uscatel squad. How about rider? Hegedal feeling a little bit frisky there on the Col de Glandon as he speeds down into the valley now. Any chance these two guys could work together and stay away? If the chase gets reabsorbed by the field, they have a very good chance of staying away to the finish line. It's a big group. They think they're going for the first two King of the Mountain points. We'll have to see how Sky, what kind of tempo they put in for Sky. It's important to stay together for as long as possible in this stage. As everyone scrambles for a jacket, as the rain starts to come down, we want as we pick up on stage 19, a massive 127 miles. We cruise through the Alps again today. We've just topped out, at least the leaders have, on the Col de Glandon, uh, but the main peloton still climbing. Cooling down in the mountains today, 65 degrees, a four miles per hour in very slight. Rain is forecast. We've seen some already, but they're going through these little patchy areas of, and that's our weather report from Palmer's Cocoa Butter for formula for men and as we look here at the rain here Paul at the drier roads they've been in the rain at front I think the peloton roughly has been getting away with it the sun's even come out here yeah well what a very very fast start to the day once again uh, almost out of the blocks the attacks came thick and fast but it's a scary situation I would have to say for uh, Team Sky because there's a 44 man uh, chasing group behind this group of the two leaders Ryder Hazardal the Canadian was the first rider to cross the summit of the Col du Glandon they will drop down a very very long and rapid descent into to the valley of saint jean de maurienne they'll go down the valley road for not very long at all and then they've got the col de la madeleine on the other side again an outside categorized climb well, let's have a look at the mountains today we've been over the hc now the col de glandon the bunch is still climbing as they continue their in fight for paris we're heading now down a long sweeper right down the valley one of Paul Sherwin's favourite mountains, the Col de la Madeleine, is where he wants to abandon the Tour de France. And then we go on into the sprint and climb steadily back up before we descend to the finish in Le Grand Bourneau. By the way, the knife and fork spot in the middle there is not where they stop for a nice restaurant lunch. It's uh, flying food as they go through the feeding station. Yeah, that Col de la Madeleine, Phil, especially from this side, is a beast of a climb. It's yeah. really hard. It's very, very difficult. And that was the year, that, in fact, it was 1980 when I abandoned on the slopes of that climb. It rained for 17 days. Every 
predate. That was the year that Bernard, you know, actually abandoned the Tour de France when he was in the yellow jersey. So I think I abandoned him pretty good company, although he abandoned about five or six days before yeah, I did. In the Pyrenees, I believe. Anyway, very interesting race today because a lot of riders believe they can win the stage. They've lost all hope of winning the Tour de France. And because of this, there are 44 riders in the bunch immediately behind the leaders. Although these boys in our camera now, who are Moser, Ribelon, the man that won yesterday at the back, and um, Pierre Roland, they are trying to now cross the gap to the two front runners who've gone over the top of the climb, Hezidal and Izagira. So it could be a very active day of racing here. Well, there's lots of racing still carrying on in this event here because, in fact, there are three riders from Team Radio Shack in that group of 44, and they could be quite seriously, Phil, trying to look at regaining the lead in the, in the team classification. This looks like, um, as we continue here, this is a very interesting race, the way this is going. And there's a couple of guys got into that break, including uh, Romain Bardet. That's Sepp Van Mark here, the Belkin boy. Interesting story about Sepp Van Mark yeah. yesterday, Phil, because, in fact, he got his uh, gear changer stuck. He couldn't get onto the small chain ring, so he rode up the Alpe d'Huez on the large chain ring and still recorded the 40th fastest ascent. Remarkable. To climb on the top chain ring, it's almost unthinkable. That's one of his highest range of gears, of course. He's coming back into the bunch. I think he was up with that leading group, but he's been dropping back steadily here on the climb of the Gondon, which is the first mountain straight out of the blocks today at Bourg-Doison. But most of the riders up there have lost literally hours as the uh, peloton now goes over eight minutes behind the main leaders on the road, which was Heja Dahl and Izagira at the top. Well, at the start, Phil, once these breakaways were starting to form, there was a group of five went clear, then a group of six, group of nine, and then they started to form at the front. But all the time, Team Sky stayed at the front. They set the tempo that they were happy to set and made a very close point of watching to make sure none of their competitors or con the other contenders got clear. You see a lot of riders got rain jackets on coming up the hill. They've been through a squall of rain, but it seems to have gone away again. So now they're taking them all off, even though we're about to go downhill here. The weather itself down at the finishing line is quite pleasant at the moment. This is Hazel Darby, very, very aggressive. I've got a feeling he's trying to go from start to finish up front today. So as we watch the leaders now begin their descent away from the top of the Col de Glandon, let's have a look then at our Cadillac performance predictions. This is the situation. Now there's the peloton pole, a beautiful descent. We're crossing now right through the heart of the Alps here as we change uh, the valleys as we go across to the Grand Bournon. Actually, that is a very good pick, I think, by uh, Scott. That's the pick that I actually wanted, so I'm a little oh, bit upset no. with that. I think uh, Alejandro Valverde is an excellent pick today, especially with the downhill finish into the Grand Bournon and then the slight kicker up to the finish line. So as they continue down, two riders in front, Izagir and Hezidal, being chased by Moser, Roland and Riblon, the man who won yesterday. Then a peloton of about 40 riders, all action today. Are high mountains. We are now bound for the giant, the Col de, de la Madeleine. And uh, this one is a really, really tough climb. Coming uh, before we get to the halfway stage of the race, but we have a battle up front now for the lead in the King of the Mountains competition. Hezidor went over the top of the Col du Glandon. He got 25 points. Uh, Jon Izegir's brother retired two days ago. He's got 20 points. Uh, Christophe Riblon, the man that won yesterday, 16. And uh, because Riblon is now looking for the polka dot jersey for himself, this is the situation. Riblon is third, but he's only 11 points behind Chris Froome and there's 25 on offer on the next climb. Quintana is second, he's back in the main field. So Riblon, Niev and Moza are both in the leading groups. So they're fighting out the next wearer of the polka dot jersey for sure. Very sensible uh, breakaway now. It was hard work to get into it, but the whole field realised the in-battle was starting between the yellow jersey of Chris Froome and the boys in black, his teammates, and the other riders on the podium. And so they just simply started sprinting around them at the front. All of a sudden, we had a huge bunch of over 40 riders going away from the yellow jersey. And over the last two and a half weeks, Paul, hardly any of them were less than an hour behind uh, Chris Froome. But in fact, there's only two riders in that that breakaway fill uh, inside uh, one hour and that is uh, Andreas Cloden and it's also Jan Bakelitz and they're at 40 minutes and 58 minutes so, so they're not going to be dangerous at all to the overall competition.
So that's the situation at the moment as they uh, as they get away. Also, uh, Roman Bardet, I think, as well. So yeah. they're only the right, but they're all with the, oh, more than half an hour behind Chris Room. So the infight is beginning. And you know, we have an incredible fight too for the second place finisher in the Tour de France. Second, third, fourth, and fifth overall after yesterday's Battle of Alpe d'Huez are separated by just 47 seconds. Without Chris Froome in this race, Paul, this would be an incredible race for victory. You know, it certainly would. Uh, Alberto Contador looked a little bit fragile yesterday, but he has had the courage to go out and battle to try and dethrone uh, Chris Froome to see if he can put Chris Froome into a little bit of danger and try and get himself uh, the victory in the Tour. And if he finishes 10th, he doesn't care. He's won the Tour de France on two occasions in the past, and I think he will fight all the way today. We're just watching here, I'm not too sure where the Omega uh, rider is here, where our cameras have picked him up, but it's, it's Jerome Pino, and he's not appearing on anywhere on our computer just at the moment, so we'll have to find out where he's going. Maybe off for a cup of tea, of course, it's a long climb coming up. The riders have been putting their racing capes on, on and off, all day because of the ins and outs of the showers. Some are leaving them on for the descent down the Col uh, du Glandon, before we cross the valley and then quickly start the climb up the Col de la Madeleine. It takes us a 19.2 kilometre climb, virtually a 12 mile climb. That's normally the workhorse uh, for Mark Cavendish. Now what's going on here, Paul? There's a a little bit of an acceleration coming from yeah. Izegir and he's dropping rider Hazedal who actually has a pedigree of being a very good mountain biker so I'm a bit surprised at this the Spanish riders opened up a slight advantage on the descent but it's nothing really too much to worry about they'll be together once they get into the valley below at the small town of San Etienne too far to go to try and break away and win alone I think 747 has come slightly down on the yellow jersey group uh, back having their own private battle as these boys are trying to add a stage win to their reputations today in the Tour de France. See you in a moment. Seated above the city of Albeville is the medieval town of Conflans. Once a fortified shelter of houses for powerful lords in the 14th century, the town's shops today mostly consist of artist studios and craft boutiques. Its cobbled streets and old fountains sit above the confluence of the Isère and the Arly rivers and features the Church of saint Gras, an 18th century rebuilt cathedral decorated in trompe l'oeil artwork. Absolutely magnificent on the inside and a beautiful town, of course. Just in the heart, not too far away from Albeville, which is the scene of the 1992 Winter Olympics. Looking at Christophe Riblon, the winner yesterday. He's pulled on the polka dot jersey. It's on loan from Chris Froome, who leads in the King of the Mountains. Froome, of course, wears yellow. But he, he is going out now in this breakaway, hunting for the over, for overall situation. Riblon's got to be careful because he's got Nieve and he's got uh, Moser pushing him in this breakaway for the lead in the King of the Mountains. But that's why he's in the breakaway. Cheers all round as the, these are the two leaders today blazing the trail and it's been some hard work by uh, Heja Dahl who joined Izegir on the attack. Yes, well, Philip, it would be very remiss of me at this time not to remind you that in 218 BC, this is the valley that Hannibal, leader of the Carthaginians, passed through with 90,000 infantry members, 12,000 cavalrymen and 37 elephants. And I've got a lot of friends who get very upset if I don't remind them about that. Now, uh, as we look here, Jack Bow, the first time the New Zealand rider has ridden the Tour de France on Garmin Sharp uh, moments ago, abandoned the race. The reports were he crashed. We've got no reports other than that, uh, but he has abandoned the race. Now, we showed you pictures of uh, Pino, Cavendish and Kwiatkowski. They weren't off the back. They were actually off the front of the peloton, uh, chasing to try and bridge to the leaders. Now, that's a sprinter for you, Paul. That's amazing to think <laughs> that Mark Cavendish is looking for that. For Mark, it gives him a chance to uh, move up in the... Uh, in the climb and start the Col de la with a 10 or 15 second yep. advantage uh, but for Kwiatkowski it could be very important because he's ninth in the overall standings at the start of the day and he's ridden exceptionally well he's second in the best young rider competition and he's thinking about trying to put a little bit of time between himself and Nairo Quintana although I think it's a very brave move well good for him at this stage of the race to be able to go and even think of attacking the peloton is amazing now seeing Pierre Horn, he's the defending champion down there as we're looking here at also joining the breakaway. Juan Antonio Fletcher has come across on the descent to make this now a five-man chasing group. I 
this is uh, looks to me as though we've got the riders here trying to get across the gap at the moment there's riders spread all over the Alps just now but of course the yellow jersey main body protecting Froome and here they are I've got all of the men that matter in the Tour de France all around them just at the moment now there's no sign in that shot of the yellow jersey I'm sure he's there otherwise his sky team wouldn't be on the front as we move up to the uh, front group here, Heja Dahl, I've got a feeling the way he moved up to Izagir on the first climb. Just see if we can... Well, I'm not too sure what... Maybe you at home can hear better than we can hear at the commentary position, but even so, Heja Dahl was the rider who quickly joined this rider it was his hard riding on the Glandon, which has built them up quite a nice lead over a chase group now of five at two minutes ten. And the first bunch after that at nearly three minutes. We'll take a break. These are the two leaders. And they're constantly talking here to uh, Ryder Hazedol. Ryder Hazedol may be unknown to him, but his teammate, uh, the New Zealander Jack Bauer, has crashed and is out of the tour. We don't know any more than that. We know that uh, Swain Tuft, another uh, rider uh, from Canada, he's crashed, but he is now riding again, reportedly. So there's a few boys wrestling with these descents from the Alps today. There's a quick 10-kilometer, six-mile ride down the valley road before we take the right-hand turn and start the Col de Madeleine, and it kicks up immediately. It's a very long climb, comes in at 19 kilometers long. That's about 12 miles of ascension. It goes up to 2,000 meters, which is more than 6,000 feet and the average gradient is 8% and it's a nasty climb because there are no real easings in the gradient. Course itself today as Chris Froome rides along there, he's stripping off actually, he's coming back to yellow at the moment but the course itself is very very vicious, it's the two outside category climbs come at the start of the race, then there's two firsts at one second and then two first category climbs before we race down for the finish. There is uh, Nairo Quintana. Today or tomorrow for him, Paul, to go for gold? Well, it suits him more tomorrow, really, Phil, because uh, his, his domain really is the mountain top finish. The thing is, with today's climb, the final climb, the Col de la Croix Free, there's a long descent afterwards, so if he does gain an advantage, he could get pulled in. But when you go to the top of the mountain, Semnos, tomorrow, he could look at moving into second. Well, the roads today are weren't built for cycle racing, I think, being introduced in 1910 and 1911, the high mountain. As we see and look, a nice surge here from Ryder Hegedal. He's very much pull on the lower slopes of the 20-kilometer uh, climb of the Col de la Madeleine, but he decides to go alone. Ryder Hegedal here this afternoon, Phil, is looking for a long raid. He's looking to try and write his names into the history books of heroic breakaways in the Tour de France. And he realises now that he's not getting quite as much help as he wanted from the Spanish rider, Yoni Zagir. So he's decided to go alone. He probably has also heard that Pierre Roland is coming across. Pierre Roland, the rider we're looking at now, is the third place rider on the road. And he is around about a minute ahead of a large group which is 38 riders strong, who are six minutes ahead themselves of the main field containing the yellow jersey. There is the group, which is actually not the peloton containing Chris Room. This is the chase group of riders. They all built up by sprinting round Sky on the start of the climb of the Col de Glandon, just out of the start line of Bourg d'Oison. Built this huge bunch up, nobody remotely near Chris Froome overall, but they are quite confident they won't be chased and they can fight out the end of the day. Put it into perspective a little bit, Phil. A climb like this, uh, this 19 kilometer climb of the Col de la Madeleine, takes the riders around about an hour to get up to the summit. That is a moment ago. Pierre Roland came up and caught uh, rider Hezadal. He saved in the effort of the chase in the last few meters. He waited for him. So they are together now, and I think that's the best thing, frankly, could have happened uh, to Hezadal because two are better than one with the distance that lies ahead on the course today. Still 77 and a half miles to ride, and we're coming up towards the last three kilometers of the Madeleine. 
This is a very sad sight, but Cadell Evans, he's blaming it a little bit on the fact that he had a very hard Giro d'Italia, which ended four weeks before the Tour started. He finished third overall in that race. He thought he was doing the right thing, but now he thinks it's made him too tired for the Tour de France. Yes, uh, he really has. I think a lot of riders who rode the Giro d'Italia, Phil, are actually paying for their efforts in the Giro because it was so cold, so much snow, so much rain. And, you know, that leaves a, a real trace on the on the organ, on, on your yeah. organism. And as you get older as a professional cyclist, it's a little bit more difficult to recover from those kind of efforts. And Cadell clocks in at 36 years of age, and he's been at the top end of these Grand Tours for quite a number of years now. He's always had wonderful tours, he's had his stories like everybody else in the tour, uh, Tours de France, but he's always had a great result. He first came uh, back in 2005, his very first Tour de France, he finished eighth. When he came back a year later, he was fourth, and when he came back a year after that, he was second with a stage win, and he stayed second for two years, and he finally won the Tour uh, back in 2011. But he's never been really mentally sound for this race he's always felt things just wouldn't come for him well the Col de la Madeleine uh, has had a word once again here because that group we're just looking at there briefly Phil was uh, the group that was 38 riders strong at the start of this climb it's now down to 18 yeah. but I think the most dangerous man uh, for Pierre Roland in, this bre in that breakaway is Mikel Nieve the rider from Uscatel Uscari he starts the day in fourth place in the King of the Mountains, and what a coup that would be for Uscatel, who've tried to do something special throughout this race, but they haven't yet been able to. That's the uh, nice uh, town of Longchamp, which sits at 1,650 metres. We've still got some uh, 350 metres to climb to the summit above this town of Longchamp, saying thanks for the visit and goodbye, and that's what's happened to uh, rider Hegedal and Pierre Roland as they continue to head up to the summit. As this is the peloton here, and it's uh, laboring its way still up the Col de la Madeleine, as it's been doing for nearly an hour now. These boys are coming up to one kilometre to go to the top of the Madeleine. So, a Frenchman again on the attack, having won a stage yesterday. They're getting the hang of this Tour de France now. Pierre Roland pacing the Canadian rider, Hegedal. They're about 800 metres, maybe nine, from the top of the Col de la Madeleine. These boys are fighting out initially the King of the Mountains, primarily the boy in green, while I think rider Hegedal is hoping to go the distance today. Yes, certainly, that's why Hegedal is fighting to stay with Pierre Roland, and Pierre Roland knows that he needs an ally once they start this descent. And, uh, it's a long descent. They've currently got a two-minute, 40-second advantage over the next group on the road. And if they want to try and survive to the, uh, the along all of the valley roads to get to the final climb of the day, they need uh, to form some kind of an alliance at the front end of the race. At 25 points in the King of the Mountains is at stake. Pierre Roland is right up in this competition. He did hold the lead, and then he announced he wasn't chasing to retain his King of the Mountains title. He was going a hunting for stage wins, but he can't turn this one down. He has 63 points to Chris Froome's 104. Froome will not score any points on this mountain. He's 25 for the first man over the top. That will give him 88 points, closing in. Certainly is. Uh, Roland, you see how he looks down there? That's one thing that uh, you can do in these big open uh, alpine passes. You, because there is, we're out of the tree line here and there is no, uh, there's no buildings to mar the view, you can look down and judge the dif distance between yourself and the next chasing group on the road. They're so different to the Pyrenean chain down in the south. Pierre Rowan, oh, just drinks required. I think he has to wait till he tips over the top. As uh, they're climbing a mountain. It's just a warning shot for the team car to get themselves ready. That was, in fact, a warning shot to the race referee who was behind, and he'll hit the race radio so that then the uh, team of rider Hazardol knows that Hazardol's going to want to take on board some liquid over the summit of the climb. 2,000 metres, the height, and the top out on the Col de la Madeleine, about 6,250 feet. As we've still got uh, Nieve here in the orange, he's going to want to go and try and take third place here because he sits fourth in the King of the Mountains and he's, he's got 73 points. So it is quite an open competition behind Chris Froome. Froome is the leader virtually by default, trying to win the Tour de France. He's been winning the mountains as well. 
but right now that's not his main aim at all and the crowd continues right the way through the gap in the top of the Col de la Madeleine look at this Roland it looks like he's going to go for it he's not going to be challenged by Ryder Hezidor that's answered one question Hezidor is out for the day if he can stay there today to try and win the stage well I think uh, the man in front there Pierre Roland just to make him sure that he's not going to get pipped on the line and just to be absolutely sure he just kicks that little bit further in the last 25 meters guaranteed over the top 25 points in the bag for the Frenchman and 20 points in the bag for the Canadian. When he came over here last year, it was Peter Velix who was first over the top. So last year's King of the Mountains coming good on the penultimate day in the Alps of the Tour de France. Pierre Roland gets the giants, the Col de la Madeleine. This descent off uh, the Col de la Madeleine is not too dangerous. It is a little bit technical, but the road surface is very good. I'll do the translation for you if you don't speak French uh, that well. Uh, deux minutes derrière means they're about two minutes behind you. Well, I can tell him exactly. It's two minutes and 40 seconds. Well, it wouldn't be deux minutes uh, avant, that's for sure. As uh, Asia Dahl now will rejoin on the descent here. There's the top of the Madeleine. They might decide, you know, Paul, because of the long journey down to the next climb, to actually let those riders join them back in the lead. This looks like thanks for not challenging me there on the climb. They're going to work together until they have to attack one another. Now we're going down the mountain. Well, I think that uh, announces the fact that Pierre Roland definitely wants to get himself uh, the King of the Mountains competition this afternoon, Phil. So I think he shook hands there with uh, Ryder Hazardal to say, well, thanks very much for not uh, taking those points away from me. Now they must get together and work as they face up to 120 kilometers if they want to survive on this day to get themselves to the finish line. Two very strong riders, two riders with great experience and still no real uh, move at the front end at the main field. So Roland getting himself 25 and Hazardal 20. Which means he now moves up into fourth place. He was eighth overall. He's moved up for the moment to fourth, but of course there's still more riders to get points over the top. Well, bear in mind that the, uh, the next riders up will be sprinting for third place and there's 16 points available for third place and if uh, Nieve gets that third place he'll get himself 16 points and he'll be just one point ahead of Pierre Roland mm -hmm. and the 15 uh, behind Chris Froome Chris Froome is sitting there not worried about the King of the Mountains but for the moment maintaining his lead in that competition as well I think Nor so the next rider, third place rider gets 16, the fourth place rider will get 14 and the fifth place rider 12 over the climb. So there's still a lot of points uh, at stake for those chasing that competition behind. Yeah, 73 points uh, for Nieve, 16 points available over the summit. He needs to make sure he goes over the top in third place as these two riders uh, make a bit of enjoyment on the descent you can see how fast this descent is Ryder Hazardal is hardly pedaling at all there and he's touching speeds of 50 miles an hour going down here these corner this is a very good surface road this is the difference uh, normally apart from yesterday's uh, descent well, this is the difference between the Alps and the Pyrenees the roads in the Alps are usually much better surfaced and much better corners and gradients yes this is when the real descenders can get to grips with the Alps and fly Looks as though Pierre Roland is not certainly not waiting for any chasing group. There is eight, there are 18 riders uh, behind him. Uh, he was told about two minutes. Well, I can tell him it's two minutes 40 seconds at the moment. We'll see them come up the mountain as we show you some of how we transmit the pictures around the world from the top of the Col de la Madeleine here, sitting 2,000 meters. Right. And here comes the group, and it looks to me as though the Nieve is on the front there, Paul, and he's not going to be challenged here because most of these riders aren't interested in the King of the Mountains. Oh, just a little acceleration oh. there. He was nearly pipped on the line there by uh, Jan Bakalant. And in fact, uh, Bakalant uh, didn't come by him, and now we, we, that is a very big gap, I have to admit, Phil. It's opened up quite a lot. Yeah, I think they took it a bit easier in that group over the last few kilometres of the climb exactly three minutes as they came over the top there now there's the start of the descent for them we we'll wait for the confirmation of who got that third place and again just to put it into perspective uh, the descent from the summit of the Col de la Madeleine is going to take the riders 30 minutes 
They're going to be going downhill for 30 minutes. That would be a joy for me. Would you be getting back on? I'd much rather go downhill than go up. There's clearly going to be no waiting by the two frontrunners on the long trip down to the valley below. Well, they've obviously uh, announced the colours that uh, they want to take out this afternoon. They have decided they want to go for the uh, the risk of riding 116 kilometres, uh, the two of them together, over the last part of this race and hope that they can survive. And with that gap at 12 minutes, uh, there's still no reaction in the main field. And bear in mind, Sky and Chris Froome do not need to chase down anybody up the road in front of them today because all of those riders are way, way down in the overall standings. 89 points for Nieva now. They gave him the advantage of third, just ahead of Bacalant. So he's now got 89 points and is one point ahead of Pierre Roland. So he holds on to third place overall in the competition behind Froome and the Quintana for the moment. Well, that's a competition, Phil, that may well only get decided on the final day, the, the penultimate day, sorry, I should yeah. have to say. Because final day in the Alps. Final day in the Alps with the uh, mountaintop finish to Semnoz, which is an outside categorised climb, and it carries 50 points. Well, I was saying the second group has now fallen back to four minutes uh, as the descent has started by the two leaders. They have really sat up back there. And then you go back a further eight minutes plus uh, to the yellow jersey group of all of the men fighting for the podium in Paris on Sunday. This is Peter Sagan and Kevin Retzer. They both want uh, a drink, I would suspect, but they're on the way up. It depends how far up the mountain they are, whether they'll be allowed to take those drinks. Geraint Thomas, is he set the tempo from the start of this climb all the way to the top. There's the results over the top. But Roland, Hezidal, Niev was second, was third, Bakeland's fourth, and Geshka was over the top in fifth place. So overall, that does this. Same two stay one and two. Riblon holds third as he did this morning, but Pierre Roland and Nieva is, is coming in. Is Sepp Van Mark, who's trying to move away from the field. This man climbed Alduez using his biggest gear yesterday, a 53 chain wheel, because his gears wouldn't work. Goodness me. 110 kilometers to go. Here's our hero from Alduez, Paul, on the front now, as the punch come up to the top. Interesting if the time is still running up there to see what the gap is. That's Sepp van Mark in the uh, Belkin jersey, just about to uh, go over the top of the climb. Now, the reason he jumped away a little, little bit like Mark Cavendish was to get a start before the start of the Col de la Madeleine, and now he's survived. But look at the gap 11 minutes and 55 seconds, maybe something like that, as they come over the top and continue their journey downhill now as they head towards the valley. Too many riders up in front, I think, for there to be anybody involved in the green jersey sprint down in the valley. And Peter Sagan isn't too far behind that group. He should rejoin it quite nicely now. now Nick Saxo Roach. Tinkoff pushing on. Nicholas Roach has decided uh, he's going to do the descent here. Again, I have to say, I question these tactics, Phil, because it is so far to go to the finish. And even if he opens up a 20 or 30 second advantage, he'll lose so much energy, use so much energy on the long road before we get to the final climb of the day, the Col de la Croiserie. We're racing down to Alberville now. It's still quite a few kilometres ahead. Looks like Cam Meyer from Orica Greenedge uh, just getting his raincoat on. He's not going to make uh, an attack on the descent. No. He snatched his jacket back into the pack. Lovely to see the riders spiral their way downwards towards the valley of Albaville, which sits right in the heart of the Alps. It was Albaville in 1992 where the Olympic movement broke work with tradition. They had to award the Olympics to a city, as, as they always do, so they chose Albaville. But the events were held in ten different Alpine towns, so it really spread the Olympics throughout the Alps itself. And uh, what a great games they were as well. That was a winter in particular. Yes, Alberville, uh, the gate to uh, the gateway to many of the ski resorts around this area. There's uh, Nicholas Roach, quite happy to sit on the front and set the tempo. I'm not sure that he's going to make a move. I think he probably regrets the move that he made yesterday, uh, 
out on the course. He used a lot of energy. I'm a bit surprised he's even tried to do a similar tactic to yesterday because he paid the price yesterday uh, sitting out in front with his teammate Sergio Paolino. There's Chris Froome with his merry men still around him here as he dives now down towards uh, base level at Albaville. The gaps are there for everybody just at the moment and we still have Roland and Hezjadol four minutes ahead of a chase group of 19 riders. France were flying down the descent here, the Col de la Madeleine, and Alberto Contador has put his teammate Stephen Roach on the front to drive the chase down the mountain as fast as possible. A tactic we've seen him employ a few times this year. For the moment, though, there's a big gap. It's still being recorded around four minutes from 19 chases to Pierre Roland and Ryder Hegedal here. 11.46 back to the peloton. hundred and four kilometers to ride we're on what is a quite a narrow section of the descent for the moment of the Col de la Madeleine it's a 30 minute descent before we hit the valleys and race into the beautiful town of Albeville scene of the Winter Olympics back in 1992 Nicholas Roach of Ireland and more particularly on this occasion a teammate of Alberto Contador leads the charge down the mountain something we're not quite sure why he's doing that. well I think he's doing it just for safety reasons more than anything else Phil because uh, that's not an attack by Ni Nicholas Roach we've not seen an attack come from Alberto Contador but they want to be in the first four or five positions because they can pick their own line around these corners and they're the ones who dictate the pace going down the descent you don't use too much energy if you ride at a sensible place that pace down a descent like this but you are able to keep a very close eye on the corners and the lines that you want to take around the corners we're talking the speeds here of around 80 kilometers an hour as the riders go through what is a very nice section of the Madeleine and not a dangerous section uh, Chris Froome was isolated slightly he had Richie Port with him over the top but the teammates have all come back to him now on the way down they were all with him on the way up then there was a little bit of a, a hiccup as Contador started to move to the front and he looked ominous for a while as if he was going to try and stretch them down the mountain but still a huge gap of 12 minutes as Roach is running away from them just now yes I think basically uh, they just wanted to be at the front for safety reasons on this descent looks like a photographer crashed on the right on the oh. rider crashed here this is Hoogland is down no it's not it's Vichot oh, it's Vichot himself the French champion well this is what happens at the back and you go around the corner and uh, you have to change your line he looks a little bit dazed there well he's, he's hurt his hands I think Arthur, Arthur Vichot we're proving a very popular French champion in the Tour de France has come off that bend a little bit too quick and hit the grass now we've had Jack Power Bauer today the New Zealand the New Zealand youngster in his first tour and that was Philippe Gilbert just going around the corner there uh, with his uh, rain cape on he's trying to shake himself back into life here get rid of the pain quickly the doctor is on the scene well the doctor does a fabulous job in the tour looking after all of these riders making the calls very quickly it's a difficult call to to make sometimes at the side of the road because every rider wants to get back on his bike and get back into the race and that doctor sometimes has to be able to hold them back and say sorry i can see that you can't continue in the tour de france today well let's hope that's not the case with r2 v show riding just three days short of paris now well it just accentuates the point i was trying to make just a little earlier phil as to why alberto contador and nicholas roach wanted to ride at the front in the first four or five positions because they have the road open for themselves to take their own speed and their own line around these curves there we are he just uh, went too wide on that corner as the peloton went around him one of two rocks there they might have collided with as well. Sharp herping Ben coming up. You, it, you have to remain so focused. Remember Christoph Riblon himself on his way to victory yesterday. He ran out of road on the dropping down the Col de Serene. Luckily he was able to stop and paddle, paddle through the ditch and get back on his bike and eventually win the stage. So this is Ryder Hegedal. Now these two have become friends, at least for the moment. We're still on our way down the Col de la Madeleine here. This is the group riding the almost 12 minutes behind the front two. Ryder Hegedal in blue and Pierre Roland. 
as they continue to speed to the valley below and then they'll come on through Albeville and start the climb of the uh, second category called the Tamier. It's not very long, it takes them up to just on uh, 1,200 feet above sea level. And you see a big crowd, you know you're going around the tight one as we cut back here to the main field which is building all the time. At the moment, two leaders, 19 chasers, the yellow jersey pack, and in front of the old desert, what was left of the original group of 41. We keep picking them up. Well, just listen to the wind there, Phil. You get an idea of just how fast these guys are going. There's another man coming back from the lead, Jérôme Cousin, just picked up now by the yellow jersey group under the escort of Nicholas Roach for Saxo. One wonders if uh, Saxo are coming forward also to start picking up a little bit of pace. You've also got a rider from Movistar coming in there. A lot of guys uh, missed out on the victory yesterday because they didn't start the chase uh, early enough. And now we're coming up to uh, 94 kilometres to go. And if Alberto Contador, for example, is nurturing any thoughts of winning the stage, they're going to have to start working a long way out. And how about Alejandro Valverde? He, his team yesterday really missed out on not chasing. And I think if they'd started chasing a little earlier, Nairo Quintana could probably have been a stage winner at the summit of the Alpe d'Huez. Nicholas Roach here has a French mother and of course his father is Stephen Roach the winner of the Tour de France in 1987 uh, Nicholas had a choice of riding for France or for Ireland and he chose to race eventually on an Irish license <laughs> 61 kilometers an hour that's about 39 miles an hour at the moment for the boys at the front coming down the hill running off the steep slopes now as they go down towards uh, Albeville itself. Still a little way. Yeah, but they're uh, extending their, ex uh, their advantage on the descent as they move up to four and a quarter minutes over the next group on the road. Yes, and this is the yellow jersey group here, which doesn't look that big at the moment. I think over the final few kilometres of the Col de Madeleine they will have lost a few guys but certainly with the kind of tempo that we're seeing here most of the riders left behind on the uh, Madeleine should be able to reintegrate on the descent. So as they continue to charge through the little towns which lie on the descent of the Col de Madeleine before we get down to Albeville we'll take another break. Join us now, another rider out of the Tour de France, Marcel Seberg has abandoned the tour for Lotto Bellasol. He's the third rider to give up the race today as the Alps start to bite back on what has been a very, very difficult journey through the mountains, as we saw yesterday on the crimes over to Alpe d'Huez. The main field containing the yellow jersey is still a long way behind and continuing the in battle while we've got this chase group of 19 here in our picture uh, just over four minutes behind the two leaders uh, Roland and Hegedal. It was on those coolers that spilled the ice and went down into the electronics of Chris Froome's team car and it came to a grinding halt hence the two 20 second penalties towards the end when they had to eventually get food to their leaders anyway we're now realizing why Saxo Tinkoff are driving the race it's nothing to do with attacking uh, Chris Froome they are in danger of losing their team lead in the race to the AG2R squad who have two riders some seven minutes ahead up the road in that group of 19 so they want to reduce that group because uh, if there is a, such a thing as a consolation prize it's certainly the team race in the Tour de France so as they continue their journey now deeper into the Alps so heading down towards Albeville then we will climb out on the Col de Tamier it's not a call we use very much um, the last man to climb over the top in first place with Thomas Vukler back in 2007 and he was a teammate of the rider up here in green Pierre Roland 
Still no sign of these two slowing down at all. Ryder Hazardal clearly up for the action today. In and out of the saddle, he senses the speed. He's found a good ally in Pierre Roland, who's tried to take his lead in the uh, King of the Mountains, uh, just outside the feeding zone at the moment. Little way to go there. Lush green countryside. And we're picking up Archer Visho here, the man we saw on the floor, and he is now rejoining this group of riders. Well, that's a nice sight, isn't it, Paul? At least uh, he's got the marks of the day on his elbows there, but at least he's coming back to some riders here. I just noticed, though, he's got a serious amount of... Uh, well, I thought it was bandages on his hand, but it's not. It's just he's pulled down his arm warmers. But uh, it's nice to see Le Champion de France back in the race. And he's been fairly visible in that jersey of his, which his team, FDJ, decided not to put any uh, advertising on because they wanted to respect Le Bleu Blanc Rouge, as they call it in France. Absolutely. The blue, white and red. Particular of France. A little bit of a uh, picture breakup. Uh, that's uh, nobody's fault, except ours, I suppose, but it is a fault with the transmission when the trees inter interrupt the signal. Three riders from Saxo Tinkoff. For a moment, they put the Alberto Contador uh, second place on the back burner while they try and keep the lead in the team race. That's why the last few days of the tour is always so very, very complicated. We've got some guys at the front of the race now battling for the, for the supremacy of the King of the Mountains competition. We've got this team, Saxo, at the back, 12 minutes back from the race lead at the moment, fighting to try and win the team classification. And that actually assists Chris Froome, because his team can take a back foot now while the other teams have to unfold their own tactics. Eyes also for the first man over the finishing line in Albeville. This town so often associated with the passage of the Tour de France. And a wonderful crowd here on the outskirts. Five hundred meters to the line. You can soon be able to see the banner in the distance. Pierre Alonte, they, they're riding like this to see whether or not they can uh, conserve some of their advantage until they get to the next climb of the day, the Col de Tamier. Although only second category, there's five points available for the first rider to cross that next climb. Well, the overall standings in the green jersey competition, which is why we think Roland will just say, go on, the rider, you can have the money and the points, is because the Peter Sagan back in the main field has got 380 points in that competition. He's more than 100 clear of second place Mark Cavendish. So uh, there's the return of a favour now as rider Hezidal puts in 1,500 euros into the team bank of Garmin Sharp. Now, Paul, this looks like the one you were talking about earlier. Well, I caught a quick glimpse of it, Phil, just out of the corner of my yeah. eye when they went by. It's the castle of Chantemerle. Yes, as we spin around the Chateau de Chantemerle, which is uh, locally known as the castle of Saint Didier. The race goes on. Everybody uh, heading down into Albeville at the moment now. Uh, yesterday, the Scott Trade value rising. Well, there was a big rise yesterday in the trade of this man. Wasn't so much at the start when his stock probably dropped as he went paddling, but when he came back up behind TJ Van Garder and Christophe Riblon was away to the first French stage win of this year's Tour de France. Tears at the finish of joy with all his supporters. He couldn't believe it. An inspired man indeed. And of course, his Scott Trade value rising as a result. Because now they're going on to the third climb of the day, the Col de Tamier. This is not a long, long climb, but it is a climb which claims points towards that King of the Mountains. Uh, and it is eight kilometers and it is 6% average, so not terribly steep, but it takes us back up now to almost 3,000 feet above sea level. This uh, is the lowest of the three remaining climbs. To come after this, we have the Col de, Col de Lepine, and that takes us on a first category journey, and then the higher one takes us to the end, the Col de la Croix Three. We're looking down here around the city of Conflans here, this ancient city, medieval town on the outskirts of Albeville. It was here where they presented at night the medals in the Winter Olympic Games to all of the lucky uh, recipients there. 
Well, we, I told you earlier, poor Jack Power apparently hit a fence and did crash out of the race. Well, we now have a photograph. This is an unfortunate picture of Jack Power, the young man in his first Tour de France. Uh, was being checked out. He's gone to hospital. Uh, we hope he's okay and really sad that he couldn't complete his first Tour de France because he's only a weekend away from Paris. That really is sad. Leaves only one uh, rider in the race now uh, from New Zealand and that is uh, Greg Henderson. Back amongst it, uh, off the back, but it was for what we call a Bezwan Naturel, and that means uh, a natural break for the yellow jersey. And he's gone back into the field, always escorted by his team. And they're safe and sound together again here. Still up front is uh, Ryder Hezidal. This uh, is something of a unique Canadian Ryder Hezidal because last year became the first Canadian to win the Giro d'Italia. These are pictures taken at that time. The Maglia Rosa, which is the equivalent of the Maillot Jaune, the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. But for him, it was the yellow jersey. Hoping for the double, but when he got to the Tour de France, this happened. Involved in a massive pileup on the sixth day of the race. Riders were everywhere, many of them not continuing in the Tour de France. Poor rider Hezidol cut to pieces on his thigh. And now he's in a breakaway again, and he's had his ups and downs of this year's tour as well. Right out at the beginning of the tour, the course crashes and breaks, a cracks a rib, and he stays with that pain to this very day as he continues towards the finish. He's put in an early effort today to try and go across the Alps. And Pierre Rowland's joined him, and they're still clear. Although the chasing group is closing in. Another view of the Isère River here as the peloton crosses it now. A chasing group, Paul, just over two minutes back of the two leaders now. They might well see them once we're over the top of the Col de Tamier. It's quite a long climb, but it's not very steep. Well, the fact is there are about three different races going on here this afternoon, Phil. You've got, oh, this is oh. a move by Pierre Roland, and he's put rider Hazardal into difficulty on the first gradient of this second category climb. Well, Hezidal has been out in front for an awful long way today and it looks like it's been a little bit too much for him now as uh, Pierre Rowland can't wait if he senses that, that he is in trouble because he needs the points. He's also looking with 69 kilometres left to go for gold at the finish. Well, as I was just starting to say, Phil, there are three races going on here. This is the main field with the yellow jersey and all the overall contenders picking up a guy who was in the early breakaway. They've been put under pressure. There's a race for the team classification, the, the team race, if you like. Team Saxo Tinkoff, with those yellow helmets of theirs, were leading that competition, or are leading that competition today. But there are so many riders in the group up front that their lead in that competition is being threatened. Then in that group behind, at two minutes, there's also another contender for the King of the Mountains classification. That's Mikel Nieve, which is why we've seen such a big chase starting to happen in their group as well. And they've halved that four-minute gap to two minutes very, very rapidly. Well, Roland has told us that he uh, had given up all hope of the King of the Mountains. He wanted a stage win. He was trying to turn it around, but he's won twice before. In 2011, won at Alp d'Huez. The last year, he won at La Toussuire. Now he's trying to win at the finish in Le Grand Bournon. You could say the Alps are extremely kind to Pierre Roland. Now he's going for gold again. What an inspiration for a Frenchman today on the Col de Tamier as they cheer him up towards the line. Five points for the first rider to cross the line, but there are only points for the first four riders to go over the summit. The second rider will get three points, the third two, and the final fourth place will gain you one point. But with five points here, that will pull uh, this man, Pierre Roland, up to 93 points. And that will be uh, the same number of points as Christophe Riblon. So he's in for this. He's better next time. He'll be looking, uh, moving very close to Chris Froome on the first category climb, if he can stay away. And he's looking as though he has a reasonable sporting chance. The gap is holding at a minute 45 from the group behind. There's the five points. Puts him above Nieve, who can't catch him on this climb. The 
slipping back down here now. This looks like it's Robert Hessing. Oh, uh, last bone rather. He may remember last was in the action on the first two days of the tour, and he looked very strong, but he's he's not a great climber. And just taking his time, try and get back over the top as they all do. Rifle not too far away from him with a couple of teammates to chase. Well, there's going to be a big sprint for the group behind who are one minute and 43 seconds back because for uh, Michael Nieve, it's very important for him to keep ticking away at these uh, King of the Mountains points. That's a competition, Phil, that may not even get decided until tomorrow. What a battle that's turned out to be. I think it is. It's closing up rather than opening out at the moment with the way it's going. Because Roland has now got 93 points. Paul said, put him level with Riblon. Maybe put him ahead of Michael Nieve. And even if Nieve gets second, he'll still be a point behind him. And there's no competition there. 147. 147, nobody challenged Nieve. They didn't need to. He gets second place. So although he loses at one position, he's only reversed a one-point difference there. As he gets Still on the Col de Tamier as you look at the, briefly at the peloton. Now we go to the man who's still making a run here to take the lead in the King of the Mountains. He still has a bit of work to do, Pierre Roland. He's 11 points off the lead held by Chris Froome. So he needs to get over the next climb because after Roman Sikar came through in second place, it's apparent that Nieva now is feeling tired and it looks as though not challenging for the mountains. Uh, but uh, this man now has got to take plenty of risks on the descent. You see how he bunny hopped over that speed bump there. The next one, he's a pretty good bike handler. Just watching a black kite circle above here as we would like to get back down to the race at the moment because it looked like it was quite a high speed descent uh, by uh, Pierre Roland. Well, thank goodness it's not an alpine vulture waiting for riders to drop off the back of the main field this afternoon. Looks like David Miller in the cars here now, loading up his jersey undone as he's on the lower slopes of the Col de Tamier and in the peloton. He was originally in the breakaway group of some 40 riders. He came back pretty early on. Well, over the summer to the next climb, there are 10 points for the first rider to cross the Col de Lépine. And if uh, Pierre Roland can get that, that will take him to just one point behind Chris Froome in the competition. Well, well, as we see one kilometre, the referees are saying exactly 11 minutes now, this group behind the lone leader. Now, get to the finish today, I think he'll feel as though he can take care of himself on the last climb tomorrow up Semnoz and then go to Paris for the final ride onto the Champs-Élysées. Well, I'm waiting to see, Phil, how uh, Nairo Quintana is going to handle this final mountain top finisher tomorrow. It's a climb that we've never been up before in the Tour de France, the climb to the summit of Semnoz, and it's a very steep climb as well. So uh, it's amazing that the Tour de France have uh, put the final on the penultimate day a mountain top finish. Although it's not been the, it's not the first time they've done it. A few years ago, they had the penultimate day finish at the summit of that horrible climb, the Mont Ventoux that we went over over a week ago. Shaking the old legs, they must surely be aching now as we continue on this descent away from the Col de Tamier with Pierre Roland trying to give it another great day for the French today. Oh, and he, oh he's holding down, he's, he almost overshot that one, he had to put the brakes on. Watch this again, watch the his back wheel locked up a little bit, bit of a speed wobble, he's, he straightened it out, but he went into that corner all wrong here. There's the peloton, they're still going up the Tamier. And it is still uh, the yellow helmets there of Saxo Tinkoff, although it looks as though little move too by the team Sky Riders here, just keeping an eye on things as they come up towards the summit. 4.1 4 kilometers from the top of the climb, but he's suffering badly. But it's not being reflected in the chase, they're still behind. Computer says uh, 75 seconds and 10 minutes and 43 to the yellow jersey. He's still holding his own out there, but he's paying the price, I think. Well, on Team Mamina, I'm not quite sure who that's for, but anyway, it's uh, 
free advertising on the side of the roads in the Tour de France. I cannot believe, Phil, that one man, after such a long breakaway on a day like this, will survive ahead of a group of 21 riders. And as we get closer and closer and nearer to the final climb of the day, the Col de la Coiffrie, I think we will see a big reaction coming from that second group on the road. Now, if Pierre Roland can get up this climb and get 10 points, he moves within one point of the leader of the King of the Mountains, which is Chris Froome. Uh, and Chris Froome not defending that lead. The only British rider ever to win the King of the Mountains was Robert Miller of Scotland. Won it back in 1984. As we continue on a reasonably flat road for the moment for the chasers, remember that we're going onto the slopes now of the Col de Lepine. The leaders are on those slopes. It's only a short climb. Then we start a little bit of a descent, and then we climb the last big climb of the day before a nice descent to the finishing line in Le Grand Bourgogne. Well, back end of the main field and you can see by the fact that it's stretched out into a very very long line the hammer is really being applied in this way there's the devil by the way if you just spotted him uh, he's actually dressed in yellow this year rather than his red cape of uh, previous years because he wants to celebrate like everybody the hundredth edition of the tour well when we come into uh, the Grand Bonon or rather when you do with the peloton you will see that the church here is uh, completely bedecked in yellow drapes uh, to welcome the 100th Tour de France into the Grand Bonon and we'll get plenty of shots of that I'm sure when whoever's going to win today's stage arrives here still uh, very far from being certain to be Pierre Roland but he is a very aggressive bike rider well, he's just actually, according to race radio, stretched well, his advantage out again to 1 minute and 30 seconds. So, he's obviously picking up a second wind of Pierre Roland here this afternoon. Well, Pierre Roland is a man that knows what it's like to win, and the Alps seem to be his favourite hunting ground, you know, because uh, he had won on the top of Alpe d'Huez a couple of years ago, and that was a terrific uh, job for the French, and he was up against Alberto Contador then. And the Olympic champion uh, from Beijing, uh, Sammy Sanchez, he outwitted and outfoxed all of them to get the win on that occasion. Yeah. But you know, the Alps have always smiled on this man, and then a couple of, in fact, the year after, Last he went year. to La Toussuire, and he went out on attack again. Yes, another tough climb. All these are alpine climbs, so it would be very fitting if he, if he were to win in Le Grand Bournon. Last year he won the King of the Mountains title. This year he said he wasn't bothered when he got so far behind. But here he is today looking for both a lead in the King of the Mountains and a stage win. Well, as you said, uh, maybe the Alps would smile on him and uh, would make him uh, three wins in three years in the Alps. But unfortunately for him, uh, I think he's got a little bit of a problem on his hands because the main field now are riding very, very aggressively, all the time being led by Team Saxo Tinkoff. But amazingly, Phil, the gap is not coming down. That's the, the town of Amalons at the moment, which takes us through 46 kilometres to go. For the leader, it's 42 and a half. But in the lovely department of the haute Savoie. These are riders all behind. They, uh, they're only just unhitched here because they've uh, been yo-yoing at the back. 6.1 kilometers to the summit of the peloton now. The yellow jersey peloton have started the climb of the Col de Lepine. This is Rame Tarame, the Estonian national champion. He came in, he's had a lot of trouble throughout the early part of this tour. And I think he's paying for what has been a very difficult Tour de France this year. He too now just seeing the time in 6.1 to go. The rider on the front, by the way, Matteo Tosato, Phil. We talk about Tour de France participations. Well, Matteo Tosato has participated in 26 Grand Tours, whether it's the Tour of Italy, Tour de France, or Tour of Spain. Well, but now, Paul, he's setting a pace here. This is a real push now. This is going to split the peloton all up the side of this mountain, the first category climb. As they hit the bottom here, the peloton are still riding over 10 minutes ahead of Pierre Roland, but the pressure's on now. This is a push by Saxo Tinkoff to test Chris Froome. 
It's also to keep them in the lead in the best team competition, but this man, Matteo Tosato, chased there by Nicholas Roach, a little bit further back, Roman Kruziger, rider with the white sunglasses in that line of riders of Taxo Tinkoff is Michael Rogers. Michael Rogers, Phil, is having a fabulous Tour de France. He's yes, in eighth, eighth place in the overall standings. What a great ride by this team, the, the whole of the team, Saxo Tinkoff. But today, they're on the back foot a little bit, but they're trying to toughen it up. They're not going to make a move on this climb, but they have to start now to toughen this race up to make a move on the next climb of the day, the Col de la Coiffrie. And I think we've dropped this man at last. No, he's still going with them, and he's holding them at the moment right on the shoulder of Chris Froome. Well, somebody must be an absolute engineer that lives in this town of uh, Marston, Marlon. That's about one of the most original things we've seen on the Tour de France in all these years. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Nope, it's going backwards as well. That's real skill for you. Well, as the tour gets tougher, Dan Martin, uh, number 175 at the back, is having a very difficult time. You know, I think we'll see a lot more coming from Dan Martin in the years to come, but let's not forget, he can always write home and say, I've won a stage in the Tour de France, and that was in the Pyrenees at Bagnères de Bigorre. And what a great win it was, but as we go into the third and final week of the Tour, it looks as though Dan is beginning to get tired, and so too is this man. He's just got to get to the finish now, Ryder Hezidal. He's been in the lead almost the whole day until finally he was dispatched back through the bunch. Now, they're continuing the pressure. What I would like to see is what's happening at the back of this large bunch here because the men who have made this race are now bubbling to the top. There is Ryder Hezidal. They don't even spare him the courtesy of a glance. Well, I think it's all because of the concentration which is coming into the male field, main field right now. Nick Roach uh, in second position there, Phil, you said before, had ridden, it was his fifth participation in the Tour de France, but it's also his tenth Grand Tour with uh, races like the Giro d'Italia and the Vuelta Espana added into. There is damage being done at the back end of this main field. There's David 39. Miller, Bohm, Ryan Talame, they've all been dispatched backwards. On the, far, on the far side, you just might have noticed number 39, the, the animator of yesterday's stage, T.J. Van Garden. What? Now, let's take a look at this. This is Peter Kenyuk here. He's been an absolute revelation with Team Sky. Peter Sagan. This is Peter Sagan. Kenyuk is behind now, unhitched. But look at the difference now. The yellow jersey group is no longer the other side of 10 minutes. Behind the leader on the road, Pierre Roland. About 149 to the chase, which is uh, 21 strong. It may have thinned down a little bit. This is the damage that acceleration has done, and it's taken care of Geraint Thomas and Ian Stannard as well. well this is the move by uh, Team Saxo Tinkoff to put a little bit of pressure onto Team Sky now, try and isolate Chris Froome for the final climb of the day. Try and have him with just one teammate up alongside him. This next group, as we see Ryder Hazardal there, 171, the big animator of today's stage. Yeah, he's just got to hang on in there now because this is not as hard as the last climb of the day, which is still ahead. Yes, the last climb of the day is 11 kilometres long. You can see the world champion just a little bit further ahead there, number 34, Philippe Gilbert. He too having a tough final uh, couple of days in the tour. That was Matthew Goss of Orica Greenish just behind him, and that's not a bad ride for Goss so far. He's unhitched now, but he is really a sprinter. This is the man who they're all out to get now on the Col de la Pine. 1.4 kilometres from the summit for Pierre Rouen. They've done the job. They knew by the end of this day this is where they would be. They've kept their leader in the exact position at the front. They've still got Richie Port there to look after him. Well, it's nine and, also and a half Lopez minutes. As well. Nine and a half minutes. This is the face of Nicholas Roach, and now this man just peeks around the corner. He can see the banner over the road, and what he's looking at is not the banner that says uh, Col de Lepine. He's looking at the banner that says Ten Points More. Thank you very much. <laughs> he has won three of the four climbs today, Pierre Roland. He's done it the hard way by going out in the attack, catching up with Ryder Hezidal, and then taking the top of the Col de la Madeleine. His total is 40 points scored, and it's put him right up there now, behind Chris Froome. Yep, he's climbed up all through the day. He said he wasn't interested in the King of the Mountains, then he said he was, and then he's changed his mind again. I think when he came out this morning and he saw the two big outside categorised climbs in the first 100 kilometres of the stage, he thought, I'm going to have me some of that. 
Well, he's certainly done it the hard way, that's for sure. Here as we go back behind the race, this is Sylvain Chavanel on his famous orange bike. Now giving up and dropping back on this uh, penultimate climb of the Alps today. There's plenty more again tomorrow and a mountain top finish again tomorrow. What a vicious final week of the Tour de France this has been. We know of four riders who have abandoned the race today. Yep, it's been tough and it's tougher for Nicolas Roach and Sergio Paulinho. Roman Kruzig here trying to do all of they can to tick away here at this very difficult pace. Chris Froome showing no signs of distress. He always looks distressed, but uh, he weighs hanging on in there. His head on one side. He doesn't seem under too much pressure just yet. Neither too does Alberto Contador sitting in third position. Just behind him, Michael Rogers, the Australian eighth overall in the standings. This is the chase group. Yes, at the back of the group, just on the uh, right-hand side there is Andreas Cloden. Right. This group now is really under pressure here. So as we watch now the descent down to the next climb, a little bit of a journey for about uh, 15 kilometers. This is the situation now. Pierre Roland, mission almost accomplished. One point behind Chris Froome. He's gone ahead of Quintana and Riblon after that 10 points there. This is the main field. There's one more climb before the finish. If he could just get that, even if he was caught afterwards, at least he'd pull on the polka dot jersey tonight. It's going to be touch and go for sure now because Saxo Bank are beginning to think of attacking the yellow jersey as they will approach the last climb very soon. He needs 10 points over the next climb. He's now on a series of descents which will take us to the base of the Col de la Croix Fui as uh, he now continues alone. 45 minutes behind overall overnight. Lost all hope of being the top Frenchman in this year's Tour de France, way back in the Pyrenees. Now he's trying to make amends. A jersey possibly in Paris. He's the defending champion of the King of the Mountains. And also a stage win would go down very, very nicely. Far from a done deal yet. There are 19 riders chasing. And he always is, is now massages his muscles here. The lactic acid building up, I'm sure. As he just tries to stop cramp creeping into those legs. Well, Pierre Rollin is not just a good, a good climber. He's a very, very good descender. Cofferty's boys are still on the front here as they continue to lead the charge with uh, their man at Navarro trying desperately to move up into the top 10 in the Tour de France tonight. Uh, they're still hovering, but they, they're either gaining or losing a few seconds, not really going anywhere compared to Roland. Yeah, there, we have just begun with Pierre Roland, the climb of the Col de la Croix 3, and it's commercial free now, right down to the finishing line here. And I'll tell you, we are going to see a nail-biter, because the chasers are now 65 seconds officially behind the lone figure of Pierre Roland, and the peloton is also beginning to close the gap. Now, straight away by the group, which has just started the climb, there's an immediate attack by Navarro. Well, I guess we should have expected this desperate moment, but this man is going for the stage win now. Well, he's not only going for the stage win, he's also trying to pop himself into the top ten in the overall standings. Little chat here going on between Michael Rogers and Alberto Contador, so what do we do now? I'll tell you what, Michael Rogers is strong. The man from Canberra in Australia, nearest camera. He's joined the side of Contador for the first time this year, left the side of Chris Froome from last year. Already the attacks are breaking up. Navarro has been joined here by Nieva as they continue now to reform under the impetus of the counter moves. The attacks have started on the climb of the Croix Free now for sure. And going on to the mountain, Pierre Roland enjoys just about 59 seconds. Jan Bakalens in third place here has joined Navarro on the move. Navarro with the most to gain overall. Also moving up there, the Lotto Belisol rider is Bart de Klerk. A bit of a revelation over this last week. And the Movistar rider moving into the picture is Rui Costa, already a stage winner on the road into Gap. It's Bart de Klerk, and here he comes again. He's, we don't talk about him very often, but he never misses a move, and he's enjoying an incredibly good Tour de France. But he finished fifth overall in the early part of this season in the Ruta del Sol. He's only 
26 years of age, but he's uh, come through the ranks of, of Belgium cycling. The clouds are starting to look rather heavy over the area around the Grand Bournon here this afternoon. While the main field is eating into the advantage of the lone leader, so too is the small chase group of 20. Well, the gap is down to 58 seconds now as they continue to attack one another. This is the last climb of the day. Desperate moments because once you're over the top, there's every reason to think you can stay clear. It is literally a flyer all downhill into the centre of Le Grand Bournon. Again, it's uh, Nieva making the response coming forward there in the orange jersey of Uskatel Uskadi, followed by Bartekir, Jan Bakalens and Rui Costa. Remember how Rui Costa jumped away from a group like this on the road into gap watch out to whether to see whether or not he's got strong legs again can well still take the team lead in this race now they've uh, a bit of common sense perhaps or they've all eased back i can see the rain beginning to fall on the chase group here now and believe me when it rains in the alps it rains look at it now it is started as they're on the climb, this will turn the running into the finish where it hasn't started to rain yet, quite treacherous if those clouds continue to move into the valley of the Grand Bournon. Well, it's still coffee just realised they could be, make a big coup here this afternoon, moving one of their riders into the top ten in the overall standings. Jerome Coppel and uh, Navarro are working very hard to try, first of all, to think about the stage victory. The descent away from the La Croix-Frie is a little bit complicated in the first part, but once they get down towards the outskirts of the ski resort of La Clusa, they become much wider, better roads. It's amazing, isn't it? We go back 56 seconds, or forward 56 seconds, and there's no rain here. That's how localised these storms are in the Alps, but unfortunately they seem to be going the same way as the race. Pierre Roland just gets on with the job as he continues to climb. He's a long way to go yet to the top of this climb. The camera operator, by the way, is inside. Just in case you were wondering, look at the rain now. The pictures are being affected as well. I told you when it rains here in the Alps, it rains and we're still dry at the finishing line. These riders now have a whole new ball game on their hands. Well, apologise for the uh, little bit of picture breakup. That is because of the weather conditions. And as you can see, uh, we're not telling porky pies here this afternoon. You know, the trouble is now, these riders, it's a horrible feeling, but when you're racing a road like this, you get films of water trapped between your brakes and the rim. And instead of slowing down, you get the feeling you're actually accelerating when you apply the brakes. That's definitely the case when you first start to put the brakes on it, but then if they, if they bite, that's when you uh, lock up a wheel, and if it's the front wheel, there's no way you can control the machine. Saxo Tinkoff this afternoon trying to defend and not only their overall lead in the team race but also trying to set something up for Alberto Contador who is sitting in fourth position. This heavy rain might spoil the attacks here today. Nine minutes the gap uh, on the leader as the rain completely comes down in bucket loads now. And uh, uh, little Voitkler here at the back, he's uh, dropping off, keeping an eye on the descent. The boys from Saxo Tinkoff are still driving the train, but the, and we're running out of it. That storm may be just behind them because we're coming out of the storm again. Yes, but the oh, gap now, we? Phil, that Pierre Roland has over the chasers is down to 40 seconds while it's still nine minutes back to the main field. Yes, 40 seconds, and there are 20 riders in that chase group. And we're looking at the legs now. The rider trying to get up the mountain first and earn himself a jersey for a full day of real hard work. Pierre Roland. The storm yeah, here with Pierre Roland. Roland. Pierre Roland has found it now. They, it hit the bunch, now it's moved up to him. Well, his gap now is 35 seconds over the rest of the group. 9.16, it is almost dark again here now as we're walking, watching Rui Costa, the man who won into Gap, making a move. Well, other dangers apply now, Paul. Guys want to gain time, they're running out of mountains, the finish of the mountains is tomorrow. Uh, what do they do? Take risk? What do they do? Well, I, I think they will uh, take a few risks. In fact, most guys will uh, do what they can to get down this descent. 25 seconds back to uh, Rui Costa. You know when you've been racing along all day like this and it rains hard like this, 
it really does start to batter the, the body as we look down here at Rui Costa. Again, sorry about the picture breakup, but it's got a lot to do with the climatic conditions. Well, we're seeing uh, the Alps bite back at the Tour de France now as we've uh, penetrated them again today. We've had Michael Rogers, been a revelation in himself. He sits eighth overall in the Tour de France, and now dropping here is the climber on the Sky Squad, uh, David Lopez. So that means now there's only one rider left with Chris Froome, and that's Richie Porte. But they're now having to pull out the big guns at Saxo Tinkoff. Michael Rogers, Roman Kritziger are the men alongside Alberto Contador, while the race for the victory of the stage is way up front. Well, the Czech Republic flag being waved there at him there on the Slovakian flag. As we look at the lineup of the chase here, these are becoming the select men of the Tour of Arteclerc, and it's going to be an attack for Navarro. In fact, the attack oh, is attack coming from Andreas Cloden. Andreas Cloden is the rider just in front. He knows the way down to the finish here. He's been over this climb before as he's got Bart de Klerk in second position. And I know there'll be a lot of people here shouting oh, for Andy ball. Schleck. Andy Schleck moving forward here onto the shoulders of Saxo Bank, onto the shoulders of Michael Rogers. This is something of a surprise here as they picked up the tempo back there. Now this is uh, actually Tom Danielson back here, gone back to his team guys in the back of the Froome group. At the front it's Costa, continuing to beat the trail up here, the rain is now bouncing down. It's got to the finishing line as well, it's not quite as heavy as where the riders are yet. He hasn't quite started to break the stranglehold of those riders chasing him behind. It's 24 seconds and that's a very bridgeable gap on the descent. However, there's still Ooh. four kilometres to go and uh, it looks like old uh, Nieve is actually in difficulty here. He was trying to get himself second place over the top of the climb, but he'll come out and fight again tomorrow. Well, we're looking at Nieves just cracked here on the climb. Jan Bacons is 42, Navarro is 139, that's Balta Klerk 23, and this rider now is setting the pace all the way is Andreas Klerden, who almost won into the Grand Bonon a few years ago until Lance Armstrong clipped him on the line. The man setting the pace, uh, Costa of Movistar. The lights of the car on the referee behind him uh, lighting up the back of his calf muscles there as we get into the very dark part of the storm here a bit further down it looks even worse Rogers having to bring out uh, the big ammunition this afternoon to try and protect Alberto Contador's second place in the overall standings Rui Costa has a 30 second advantage now over the four chasers if he crosses the top of this climb with a 45 second advantage with 13 kilometers to go I don't think they will ever see him again. And what a ride it will turn out to be, because remember, he's been in that group which originally of 41 riders, split down to 20-odd riders, came down to 16, and then he left them, wiped out Pierre Roland, and has gone on himself. Well, it's amazing when you think that we've talked about the youngsters in the Tour de France this year at 22, 23, 24 years of age. The man chasing there, Andreas Pluden, he is 38 years of age. He turned 38 just before the start of the Tour. The stamina is there. Can he hold on? Can they close the gap? 20 kilometres to go. That's up for the front. These boys are on the further down, the final climb of the day. A climb we very rarely see the Tour de France on. It's only the third time we've climbed this road, this way in to Le Grand Bournon. Normally, we come in over the top of the giant Col de la Colombière. Do you think the organisers are getting soft? I don't think they're getting soft when you bear in mind we went over the Col de Glandon for breakfast and then for uh, brunch we went over the Col de la Madeleine. I think this is quite fine, thank you very much. Well, another rider has blown out here. Uh, the nine-minute game, I think it's Seth Van Mark has gone there. Here we go now, this is the first attack, and it's come from Movistar, surprisingly. Alejandro Valverde, uh, I felt this was a great stage for him, but he's not going to bridge at uh, nine minutes and 14 seconds on a day like this, but he may well find himself popping inside of the top 10 overall. He started the day in 11th place overall, just behind Lawrence Tindam. Movistar making another move, they're 24 minutes behind in the team race, so I don't think they're going to get their team back, but they're certainly showing they're finishing this race strongly indeed. Now, a nine-minute game, it's the 
situation for Navarro over the peloton at the moment uh, would mean he would move up into eighth place overall tonight. And that would take the place of the man setting the pace there, Michael Rogers. 15 kilometres to go now. Still a long way to ride, but he's getting closer to the summit. That makes two kilometres to the summit of the climb. This looks like uh, Jean Bardet, uh, Romain Bardet here. Not too sure. No, Jean Gadre, the other one. The other climber from on the team of AG2R. Well, they're all jumping away now from the group to get themselves uh, the lesser placings. And not going to see the front end of the bike race here this afternoon. But almost certainly we are looking at the man who will win because Rui Costa has a 53-second advantage over the four chasers of it. Alejandro Valverde is riding away by Gadre. Yeah, Gadre is coming across the gap, but now you start to see it's Roman Kruziger pushing up the picking up the tempo there with uh, Val, uh, Alberto Contador. He really does not look comfortable, uh, Contador, but these two have been uh, very, very strong in the mountains. And, you know, Froome is getting the exact ride he wanted here today before we finish of a big mountain tomorrow, not far away from Annecy and the borders with Switzerland. Valverde now pushing on alone. Gadre hasn't quite got across to him. Uh, these are the support cast at the moment as they leave behind the riders who are fighting out the podium in Paris. They're all huddled together for warmth and they don't seem to want to come out to play. This is back with the leader, Rui Costa. His advantage over the chase is now 49 seconds. He must be starting to feel quite comfortable. He's around about a mile from the top of the climb as Mick Rogers now, having done all of that pacemaking, is slipping away and he could be losing his eighth place in the overall standings with all that work he's done putting in for the team. Also in difficulty on the left is Andy Schleck. Schleck again riding on the left, but he's not got far to climb to the summit. We top out the mountain, 13 kilometres to go. For Roy Costa, he's not far away. He's looking for the one kilometre sign now. What a magnificent crowd this is today. He needs every second to win the stage today after this dramatic crossing of the Alps. What a big question on a day like this when the rain comes down towards the end of the stages. How are the tyre pressures? Because uh, these riders, I think most of them had a feeling there was going to be rain towards the latter part of the day, so they've probably got their tyres pumped up just a, a little bit lower than they would normally have on a dry day through the mountains. And that could go to the advantage of this man on the descent because with this wet dampness on the road, it could make one or two of the corners a little bit tricky. He's going to get the king of the mountain points as he comes up to the summit of the last pass of the day. There's more tomorrow on the menu, but for now, Rui Costa is tipping it downwards and heading towards the finish in Le Grand Bourneau. Well, I think what we're seeing here with Saxo Bank Tinkoff, they're actually playing a defensive role for Alberto Contador's second place in the overall standings. Riding a tempo like this is going to stop Quintana going out on the attack. But one thing Quintana has got, Phil, he's got Alejandro Valverde just in front of the group. Now, if he makes an attack within the last kilometre and gets across to Alejandro Valverde, Quintana is not looking for very much to overtake Contador for second place. As we come to the end of this year's uh, 100th edition of the Tour de France, they are still working out seconds rather than minutes. On the way down the hill now with Rui Costa, the Portuguese rider, the only Portuguese rider in the Tour de France. And it doesn't look to me as though he's showing any respect at all to the glacial surface of the slope. Yeah, but this is a good road down here into the outskirts of the ski resort of La Clusa. It's uh, recently been resurfaced. It's had a lot of rain on it, so a lot of the a lot of the grease will have been washed off the surface here. He will go down here flat out, full ball around all of these corners. Although well, he comes out the other side, he's got a minute now on the chasers. 9:05 to the breakaway of Valverde. There's still plenty of riders in front. Of Valverde and John Gadere. With a minute's lead on the descent, it should be possible to win, but you've got to be careful. Well, he doesn't need to make too many risks on a descent like no. this because he's got a solid one minute advantage, and the group behind they won't be able to rival his speed, even if they pull off a couple of seconds every kilometer or so. He has the advantage of picking his own lines around the corner. Back onto the climb itself as uh, De Costa has 11 kilometres to race down to the finish. 
Nice to see that Andrew Talansky, sorry, Phil, yep. to see Andrew Talansky's managed to stay in contact here, just on the back there with this very small select group. Talansky showed all the signs of a great tour rider in the years ahead. He's only a youngster, 23 years of age in Miami. Does it rain in Miami ever? Uh, apparently not, not very often anyway, but when it does, it is quite torrential. A bit like the Alps then. The rain umbrellas are still up at the finish, but there's nothing like the torrential rain. These boys are getting out on the higher roads, so he's descending to much drier roads, which will be a little bit of a help for him. And uh, delighted to see our camera bike. He's lying off the back of it there, just in case he slides out. Well, these are good roads. He's not too far away look now. How the, look at the roads, dry. Yep, he's Amazing. not too far away from getting into the house because that's uh, the ski resort of La Clusa just in the bottom there. Ten kilometres to go. Ten to go. The roads are soaking wet on the way up. He's racing into drier roads on the way down. That's going to give him an advantage. 9.19. The peloton have had the wings clipped on the Alps today because of this rain. They haven't gained hardly anything on the lead rider at all. Incident. He's got just 10% of his energy left. He'll use it all there to give him a little break before he'll drop off. One minute back to Andreas Klerden, who's on his own now, by the way. Jan Bakerlands is dropped by half a minute behind him. They've all split up. 8.58, coming in very slowly. Valverde and Gadre, the peloton of the yellow jersey. Nine minutes and 16 seconds. Rui Costa of Portugal and the Spanish Movistar team is taking this race down to the Grand Bornoff. And Andreas Cloden now onto the drier roads on the outskirts of the ski resort of La Clusa. It's pretty much all downhill to the finish, although pretty nasty of the organisers. It kicks up uh, the last uh, 200 metres here to the finishing line. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Don't think that'll make too much difference to the winner today. And he keeps the lead he's got now. He's holding one minute on Andreas Cloden who knows this town very well indeed. Clerden leading his Radio Shack team. There's a chance they could be the team leaders if things go well today for them. One minute, one thirty. back uh, to a group of De Klerk, Bakerland, Nieva and uh, Navarro. Navarro making the big kill. Started the day 19 minutes behind Chris Froome and at the moment he's about seven minutes ahead of him. 38 years of age, uh, Andreas Clerden. And... Uh, He's taking uh, some serious risks on the descent. These are the remnants of... Oh, well, that's, that's uh, Valverde just a little bit further up. So they're actually starting to pull back Alejandro Valverde. Igor Anton is the rider with 1-1-1 on his back. Uh, just hanging on at the moment. He's a good climber as well. Bryce Fellu, number 211, the leader of uh, Soyosun. He is slipping backwards. He was in the breakaway for a lot of the day this afternoon. But again, for him, this was one hill too far. We're in La Clusa now. The crowd don't care it's raining, they're watching the Tour de France. Rui Costa doesn't care that it's raining either because he's got a 50 sec 58 second advantage over Andreas Cloden. One minute 30 back to the group containing his teammate Jan Bakalan. It's still 9.15 back to the main field. I have to say, Navarro, Daniel Whoop. Navarro, this is will be doing a great job. Now they've seen Bowen, the Contador saw him coming, this is the re reaction, this is the fight now, the 47 second men, these are second, third and fourth in the Tour de France, they can't let anybody out of the sight, they've reacted. Well, they're separated from uh, second place down to fifth place by just four, fifth, 47 seconds and that's why this move is coming, but Chris Froome has responded very quickly to get onto the back of that grab, he doesn't want to let anybody grapple any seconds back at all. Desperate moments. John Gadre has been caught with Alessandro Valverde because uh, now it's uh, Curito Rodriguez who's made a move here. This is his favourite terrain when he makes late runs on steep climbs. At the moment, it looks as though it's put Richie Port in trouble now, but it's OK for the yellow. He's still up there. Well, he's only just up there. He's under a little bit of pressure just at the back of that group time to get onto the wheel of Quintana and Gadre, but he's done it. So, Richie Port in more than a spot of bother here now, but his team captain has made the split. If we go under, five kilometres to go for Rui Costa. He's still on wet roads, but not quite as bad as the race uh, uh, yellow jersey is back there. 
Well, he's got a very safe buffer now, Phil. He's got a minute over this man chasing him in second position on the road, Andreas Cloden. Cloden uh, also may well be riding his team into first place in the team competition this afternoon. Valverde is trying to really rip this race apart. I'm trying to see whether I can see the yellow jersey of Chris Froome still on the back of this group. Froome doesn't have to worry too much, but what Valverde is trying to do is try and crack Alberto Contador. And look at this, Paul. Richie Paul coming back as best he can. Yeah. He will never give up now. The last, this is Quintana now as they come up to the summit of the climb trying to accelerate. Quintana was started the day a third overall in the Tour, Tour de France. 21 seconds behind Alberto Contador. Contador jumps onto his wheel. Uh, Rodriguez is here. He started the day just 14 uh, seconds behind the rider in front of him. Kreuzinger, 47 seconds, covers the boys. They're all hooked up together. Well, Valverde comes straight to the front once more and says, right, well, what can I do here? What can I take to do? To, what can I do to take advantage That's of this? Valverde gone again. Yep, straight over the top. And now it's uh, Quintana, Contador and Froome with, with Rodriguez just in front. Well, the one missing here is Kreuzinger at the moment. And he is losing his place overall if he doesn't come back up to Alberto Contador. As we start now descending onto uh, just very slightly damp roads here, it's amazing, but as he comes in towards the finish, it's pretty dark, but the roads are not wet yet. And uh, De Costa is going in now for sure to win this stage. What a great victory, topping and tailing the Alps at the moment, winning our first visit in the other day. Three kilometres to go for Rui Costa. Valverde as well, Phil. What a fighter that man uh, from uh, Movistar. Uh, he was uh, second overall. Well, this is the saint jean de Sixth. By the way, you turn right here. Yeah, I tell you, it was a tricky old bend, that one. Three kilometres to go. I was just starting to say about Alejandro Valverde, second in the overall standings uh, as we went into the stage of saint amand Morin and caught out in the crosswinds when he had a mechanical incident at the wrong possible time. Lost everything, plummeting from the second to 15th overall. But he's remained combative. He's remained aggressive in this race and so too has his team they've been up for the fight we are on the descent here this is the rider momentarily in second place he's been there for a while now but he's losing ground to Costa he's now uh, well he's not losing ground. he's exactly one minute he's not moved and 8.51 back to Valverde and the rain is still with the race at the back well those white motorbikes you can see uh, every now and again with AG2R on them they're not team cars from AG or team motorbikes for AG2R they're actually the race radio that give the information of the numbers of the riders who get into the breakaway and a quick acceleration there to that corner by Chris Froome. Two kilometres to go for Rui Costa. He's trying to win the stage, his second stage when he won into gap. I don't think there's any doubt about now. The only thing that will take him out will be an accident. We don't wish that on him. He's on slightly damp roads. He's driven too far ahead now. He's being chased by Andreas Claude, a minute behind. Then we've got the rest of the riders. He's sweep to the right. He's heading into the Grand Bournon. And the riders uh, who are challenging for the yellow jersey are all ganging up around Chris Froome, but they look to be coming home together. Costa just looks over his shoulder. He wants to know if uh, he has to keep riding hard like this, but I tell you what, mate, it's about a kilometre behind you if you want to look back and see the rider who's chasing, because that's yeah. where Cloden is currently. Yes, 58 seconds, they're saying now. As he continues, he's clear to run to the finish. It'll be at least 800 to 900 metres back to Andreas Cloden. This is Richie Port, who has dropped on the uphill, now trying to get back to his team captain, Froome. One kilometre to go. This now is for uh, Rui Costa. He's into the last thousand metres, and he's done exactly what he did on the run into gap, except the weather is slightly different. He's lining himself up for his third stage victory in the Tour de France after the one he got a couple of years ago on the summit finish at Super Best. He wants to have a quick chat with the team management. Thank you very much. Well done. He's pulled it off again, he's reversing the fortunes of Movistar that lost everything in the crosswinds uh, 10 days ago and now he's putting up a second stage win for them here. Yes, uh, wait for the final little kick up to the line as he comes closer to the finish here. The Grand Bournon has seen some dramatic finishes but I think the dramatic images of the rainstorm these riders have just been through will be remembered for quite some time to come. He's going to be applauded all the way when he gets inside. Here he comes on the way to the line. He's uh, waiting to 
a smile. He punches it almost identically as to when he rode up the Avenue Foch in Gap to salute the crowd there. He punches the air. Win number two for Portugal. His third in the Tour de France in history. It was not an easy victory. He'd been in the lead with groups of riders from the gun today. He survived the best. Just looking back, I can't believe that he's got a clear piece of road behind him. Just making sure before he salutes the crowd, Valverde wasn't sleeping in in the shadow of the crowd. Roy Costa gets the victory. Take my hat off to Andreas Cloden. He's going to finish second on the stage, a stage where he finished in second place in 2004. But still at 38 years of age, Phil, this man has got the ability and the dedication to keep himself at the top end of this sport. And he might be riding Team Radio Shack back into the lead in the team race in this race. And that means they will take something away from the Tour de France 100th edition. That's right. They've got Jan Bakelin in the next group due in here as well. That'll be two of their riders in. They've got more in the next group there's a chance they'll be pulling on the yellow numbers tomorrow but for now it is going to be second place for Andreas Klerk now who's winning the battle between the Dirk Bakalons Niev and Navarro so another great victory for the Portuguese rider the second for him Big race up to the line, this is for third place, and this is Genier here being taken on by Bacalance. Bacalance, don't forget, another Radio Shack man, the time starts, the time is stopped on the first three riders of each team. They could be moving back into the team lead. And this man, we saw him winning Corsica, and he's still riding well in the Alps. Pretty impressive for Radio Shack on uh, this mountainous day today, second and third place for them. So they'll be pretty happy with that. Wait for the third man to come in. Genies will get fourth. And also coming in, Phil, a great operation by Daniel Navarro, the rider in the red jersey there. He's going to cross the line. Well, he will have lost two minutes to Rui Costa, but he's probably going to finish seven minutes ahead of the yellow jersey group and a lot of the other competitors. So Navarro should theoretically pop into the top ten. Sepp Van Mark comes in. Another good ride by him. He finished second, remember, in Paris-Roubaix, just losing out to Fabian Cancellar, who happened to be on Team Radio Show. It's in the EVA. These are the survivors of an amazing attack early today as they started the climb of the Col de Glandon. Jesus uh, Hernandez is the rider in second position for Team Saxo Tinkoff. And a uh, big rider from Movistar coming in there is uh, Ruben Plaza. Crowds cheering them all home here. 41 riders getting away early on today. These are the survivors. And the young rider in the white jersey, that's Roman Bardet, the young Frenchman uh, who was the best young rider, the best French rider after his teammate crashed out yesterday. Yes, and Bardet looking to move up from 17th place overall in his first Tour de France. We'll see where he finishes later. Or moves up too, rather. I think a bit big mistake made by Movistar when they call back Rui Costa to help uh, the broken wheel of uh, Alessandro Valverde but then having said that he may not have been allowed into these moves well this if, is the uh, yellow jersey the group now and there's uh, a lot of pressure here uh, the yellow helmets there are the helmets on the shoulders of the riders from uh, Saxo Tinkoff and that of course is uh, Roman Kruziger and it's also Alberto Contador just scrambling onto the back of this group for with five kilometers to go. Number six, Richie Port. Never gives up, does he? Never gives up. He had a great first day in the Pyrenees. He had a disastrous second day in the Pyrenees. And since then, he's just made sure he's been around to help his team leader, Chris Froome. Let's go back down to the finish here. Arbus Shimano, it's not the big figure of John Deckenkolb is coming in, that is Tom de Moulin, a rider they are saying watch out for in the future. Well, trying to uh, preserve their positions in the overall standings here. This is Alberto Contador in person now, Phil, having to do all of the pacemaking over the last few kilometres. As Port hangs on to the front, the riders sit second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth in the Tour de France are in this group. 
They have not gained or lost a single second of their situations in this year's Tour de France. Four to go. Well, we cut away from that picture, but it looked to me like we had a bit of an attack at four kilometres to go there. This is Simon Geska coming in. He was uh, one of the two riders from Argo Shimano who were in this uh, leading group. What a battle these guys have had throughout this mountainous stage. Well, let's see if we can get back out onto the course because it looked to me as though uh, Rodriguez was getting a little bit frisky out on course. As they all come back up to the race here, this is Roman Kruisinger, Kruisinger here, and he's got back to this group, so he's preserving his fifth place overall at the moment. Haven't seen the third radio shack man come in, Paul, so that's uh, still up for grabs. Well, he's in this group. Just sitting at the back there, you can see him. But um, this has been a huge battle, but none of the leaders in the overall standings have been able to uh, prize apart their positions between second, third, fourth and fifth. Although I do have to remind you, Phil, that there's a very serious mountain top finish tomorrow to the climb up around Semnoz. And, and that, that is, that is showdown to de decide who finishes second, third, fourth and fifth in the Tour de France because that grouping, separated by 47 seconds, are all here in front of us now. Kreuzinger says, come on, start work. Well, Laurent Didier says, no, it's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they've... Uh, I think they must all be a little bit afraid tomorrow, Phil, as they come up to... Here's uh, Pierre Roland. He really hit the wall over that final oh, few kilometres. Oh, surprised what a brilliant ride he did today. He's put himself in striking distance of winning the King of the Mountains now. He will be the most outstanding rider. He'll wear the red number tomorrow most aggressive or combative rider as they call it in French and um, he's still got a chance of pulling that uh, King of the Mountains title on the right up to the last climb tomorrow at Semnos. Six and a half minutes has gone by so the yellow jersey group has not encroached too much on the original advantage. And disadvantage. that's Armel Moinau just over on the left hand side the rider from uh, BMC Racing. Well, this is back out on course now, and this rider is really giving it his best shot now. Well, this is uh, Alejandro Andre Valverde and still, Valverde. and Valverde is fighting to get himself inside of the top ten and maybe overtake Lawrence Tendam, quite possibly overtake uh, Michael Kwiatkowski, who was in serious difficulty on the climb. Well, the way he's riding and not asking uh, Gadre for any assistance, I think you're absolutely right. At one kilometre to go, he's racing the time here. Inspired by the fact he will know his teammate has won the day. Little flick of the arm there. Can Gadre come through? You see, he flicks his left arm, which he indicates, come and give me a hand here. Because here comes the group here at 1K to go. Richie Paul has got back to the front. He's hooked up the carriages, and he's now trying to tow uh, Chris Froome back up to those two riders. This is just an urgency, Phil, to make sure that they finish off of the penultimate mountain stage, the second of three stays in the Alps, as quickly as possible. Dragging up uh, Chris Froome to the finishing line. As Gadre and Alejandro Valverde look to see what they can do and Valverde is looking to peep inside of the top ten today. Valverde kicks again, can Gadre go with him as they come up to the line? It's all about time rather than positions here. And they're also thinking of the team award but I think they've lost a little bit too much for that. Valverde comes round the corner, they're going to face it, John Gadre and the others are not very far behind them as they caught this nasty little climb to the line. It could have, in the case of a spin finish, been absolutely decisive. There's the group behind, almost catching them. Help the motorbikes realise it. Big competitor Alejandro Valverde after being taken out of the race because of a mechanical problem on the road to Santa Mar Moron. Well, if you had our earphones on, you would have heard the screams of the referees about those motorbikes because Rodriguez on the left, and they come up, Jakob Fulsang comes through first, followed the yellow jersey. That was a big battle there, Phil, I have to say. That's Andrew Talansky just on the right-hand side yeah. in the blue. Big battle for Alberto Contador because Rodriguez was just looking for a few seconds there. A few seconds, but they've all been given the same time, but the motorbikes were almost impinging that sprint finish there. This is the winner today. Yes, Rui Costa. Tour de France brings out all of the emotions.
Well, we've seen another exceptional stage of the Tour de France today. Let's have a look how they've crossed the line. Six hours in the saddle it took them to cross the Alps today. Rui Costa getting the victory. Just 48 seconds over Andreas Cluden. 144 over Jan Bachelons, the early leader of the Tour. Alexandre Genier, a Frenchman, he's got fourth today. Daniel Navarro, fifth at 155. He'll move up the overall tonight. Bart de Klerk, another man that's keeping his great form. Sixth, Robert Hessing, showing form at last in seventh. Uh, Niev, very close to taking the lead in the mountains. Ninth, Ruben Plaza in tenth. Only 2.44 off. They are the top ten riders over the line, of course, but uh, the men that have matter in this year's Tour de France have all finished locked together. here in France as they leave the town of Annecy and head 78 miles straight up to Annecy Semnoz where the finish is today still in the neutral zone as the field rolls out of town on a picture perfect day after two days Bob of nasty weather rain and climbs today it is blue skies there and here if you were with team Saxo Bank or Movistar Bob and you were still racing what would be your plan well 47 seconds separate second from fifth the podium in the Tour de France is a crowning achievement in your career only two out of the four men will be able to get that along with Chris Froome to be on the podium in Paris. So it's going to be a brutal battle up the final climb for the final podium in the Tour de France. If I'm Movistar or Saxo, all in on today's stage. All the miles, uh, all the marbles are in play on today's stage and everything to race for still. It's a live start here before we look at the route as they are on the sides of Lake Annecy and it looks like Pierre Roland has seen kilometre zero and has attacked. Well, not surprising. It's a very big day for him because not only are we going to sort out the podium positions today, Phil, we're also going to decide who is going to be the final winner of the King of the Mountains competition. And this man who's attacked from the gun here is only one point behind Chris Froome. Yes, absolutely right. What a great battle he had yesterday. The hero of the French newspapers this morning because he was away for virtually the whole race. And now he's off looking for a single point to join Chris Froome on the head of the table. Of a crazy tactic actually Phil because there are 50 points for the first rider to cross the finishing line. It's an outside categorized climb so I feel that the man who wins the stage today if it's one of the big favorites is going to be the man who's going to win the yeah. King of the Mountains. All right well we've got full coverage of course coming up but let's have a look now at the Geico stage map Paul. Yep which starts at Annecy as we can see alongside a beautiful lake here starts to go along the outskirts of the lake to begin with over the Côte de Pouget but really despite the fact that we've got some rather interesting climbs out on the course it's very very, very much all about the final climb of the day. The Mont Rivard, by the way, the first country climb, that is very, very difficult too, but it really sets it all up for the ascent of Semnoz. It's all about the end of the day as far as I'm concerned because that's where the big decisions are going to be made. But there could be a little bit of a surprise on the Mont Rivard. It's uh, ideally placed and not too far away from the finish, but that climb towards the end, Phil. If you uh, crack up and you hit the wall, it's all over. And another attack starts again as Jens Voigt goes away. So we'll come back up to you, Todd and Bob. Bound for Paris today, we say goodbye to this beautiful area around Lake Annecy, but only just down the road where we finish up on top of a new mountain for the Tour de France of Semnoz. And they're already going very fast. Let's have a look first of all at our weather report presented by Palmer's Cocoa Butter for, only for men. A lovely warm day today, 83 degrees, light winds, sunny all day. So gone, we hope, are the storms of yesterday as we came down to the Grand Bournon, which is only 20 miles away from where we are now. Quick look at the leaders there, uh, Marcus Burkhardt got himself in there. This is a chasing group that we're looking at right now who's trying to get across. They came out very quick. Marcus Burkhardt, Jens Voigt, Pierre Roland and Juan Antonio Fletcher. And there they are. It was started by that attack right from the gun today of Pierre Roland and Jens Voigt was after him and then he was joined by Burkhardt and Juan Antonio Fletcher. Now Pierre Roland has gone out there in search of five points for the top of the Côte de Puget which is only 12 kilometres up the road and a lot less than that now. Well, this is a big, brave move by the Frenchman who yesterday said, Phil, he wasn't actually trying to win the King of the Mountains competition. He was really trying to get himself the stage victory. The leader in this competition is Chris Froome with one point ahead of Pierre Roland. That's why Pierre Roland's trying to get into that breakaway. Mikhail Nievi is in third place and uh, Nairo Quintana is in fourth. But the points are very, very close together. So the peloton 
are blocking up a little bit. There is Sky on the front as we start that climb now. It's only a short climb, 5.4 kilometers to the top of the Côte de Pouget. And Jens Voigt working as he has done throughout the three weeks of this race, right on the front there. Well, this could be a perfect start for uh, Roland, but there is this little group coming across, led by Simon Clark. Cyril Gauthier has made the move as well. Uh, Christophe Riblon, Pavel Le Brut, Mikhail Astrolosa, and Simon Clark, as you said, is the rider just on the right-hand side in the pale blue and lime green jersey from Orica Green Edge. Rublon still featuring up in the overall as well in the King of the Mountain, so it's not a done deal yet. He's uh, in fifth place, 93 points, so he's only 11 points off himself. Let's go immediately with tyrack.com inside the race, and let's hear from Steve Perino. Hey, Phil. Well, I had a, a rather interesting night last night where I uh, went to the back of the Sky bus with a couple other members of the U.S. media. In fact, invited by the Sky folks. And really what they were telling us was that while they have enjoyed having the yellow jersey, uh, they have under a great deal of scrutiny from the media uh, because of doping questions and they can understand that in the post Lance Armstrong era on the other hand they find themselves in a very uncomfortable position of trying to prove a negative how do you prove you're not doping and then the media on the other hand how do we prove a positive so they were trying to be a little more open with what they were doing and in discussing Chris Froome what they said is that they did release and we saw it in the newspaper Lake Keep a French newspaper a lot of his power data and an expert that they employed said hey there's nothing suspicious about what they're showing us here the one thing that they did allow us was that Chris Froome has improved in the area of his efforts over 20 to 30 minutes and not only that but his ability to apply that power later in the race and that is really what has changed in their opinion with Chris Froome over the last few years certainly it's something that they've worked on but under duress in the heat uh, in the heat of competition at the end of a race Chris Froome's ability to put out his maximum power for about 30 minutes is truly impressive. Could be handy on a day like today. Yes, very handy indeed. Yes, I think Chris Froome but, uh, has handled it very, very well with the situation of daily being accused of using drugs. Well, as, uh, I think uh, Steve uh, brought a very good point from Team Sky there, that it's very, very difficult to prove your innocence, and that's the way it has turned out these days. Uh, a very nice look there at uh, Mont Blanc, and it looks like uh, there's a, a gentleman up at the top there about to take a, a rather interesting and dangerous descent. Yes, that's the very, very top of the highest peak here in the Alps. That's Mont Blanc overlooking the lovely town of Chamonix. We'll take our first break on and glorious sunny conditions today and as we've just seen there uh, Jens Voigt uh, pushing on the pace but now look at the face here of the man in the polka dot trying to make it his on this very climb. Yeah, Phil you mentioned Talansky being 16 minutes off the race lead well he's only 16 seconds off a 10th place a top 10 finish so I'm sure he'll be thinking about that in the last 30 minutes of the stage this afternoon. This is the next group on the road. Igor Anton is the rider in the orange jersey at the front. His teammate Astalosa nearer the back. This is Cyril Gauthier, Riblon. Uh, Astalosa, Simon Clark is the Australian in that move. He's in chase group at the moment. Five points available at the top of the climb today. One point uh, behind Chris Froome is Pierre Roland. Uh, but, Paul, you've pointed out there's only 21 points available on the course today. There's 50 points for the stage winner. So Yes, the outside categorised reply at the end has double points so my working out is that the guy who wins the stage or finishes second or third is the most likely to win if it's one of those guys in the top few in the overall standings okay well as the riders continue to zigzag their way up the first climb of the day the summit just a kilometer away we'll come back for the top as we looked out the top of the Côte de Pouget, a little bit narrow here, but this is the main field going over, about 1 minute 34. We can now show you the result of that climb, because we'll have a flashback as the four leaders came up. Unchallenged, uh, Pierre Roland, for the moment at least, he is now the leader in the King of the Mountains. He won there ahead of Juan Antonio Fletcher, Jens Voigt and Marcus Berghardt. Only the four riders getting points there. Yes, but look at the speed of this main field. Uh, we see, see the results. Five points for Pierre Roland, so that will give him the overall lead on the road at the moment. But when I see the armada of Movistar here moving to the front end of the main field, that indicates to me they are seriously thinking about winning the stage this afternoon with their star climber from Colombia, Nairo Quintana. 
Nice little workman like group this. Uh, Christoph Riblon trying to get up with the six riders who are chasing. And if that formed a 10 man group, they might be developing quite a long breakaway. It's a fairly short stage today, but it's a hilly one. The next car will be only third category, followed by another third category, two more third categories. Then we climb Mont Rivard, which is a really difficult climb, first category. We top it out with uh, 46 miles, uh, 46 kilometers to go. And then the climb of Semnoz, which no rider during the Tour de France at least has raced up. It's the climb of uh, Mont Rivard. The first category climb there is 10 miles long, 16 kilometers. Drop down into the valley, not too far away from uh, Annecy. And then that final climb of the day, that's the showdown I reckon today. It certainly has to be. Got to be. That will end all the climbs in the Tour de France with an all category climb. Well, as we look at the leaders here, let's have a look, first of all, as we start our day today with our daily Cadillac performance predictions. And now this is the, well, back with the leader now of the King of the Mountains. He held the lead for around seven days last year before his teammate uh, Vaucler took over the final mantle in Paris. But at the moment, Pierre Roland has got the lead. It's a short stage today as well, Phil, uh, just 125 kilometres, 78 miles, so the teams are not scared about working very, very hard early on. This is the six-man chase away, chase group, and you can see the two riders from Uscatel, Uscadi. They're looking for the move today because really they haven't had as much out of this Tour de France as they would have liked to. Well, they're coming up at the moment, so they've just slipped onto the third category climb, the Col de Lechaux. It is only the first two riders this time getting points, but it looks as though they may have company on this climb. 3.6 kilometres long, 6.1%, 107 kilometres to go from the uh, top, and a height of over 3,000 feet. But it's all just the hors d'oeuvre for the Mont Rivar and the final climb of the day, Seminoles, because they are both brutes at 16 kilometres of climbing and at 10 for the final climb of the day. Jens Voigt at the front, been driving along breakaways from the gun throughout his three weeks in this Tour de France at 41 years of age. The oldest man in the race, Marcus Burkhardt. All four riders here have won stages uh, throughout time in the Tour de France. So they all know what it's like to get home first, but they're now being joined by Christophe Reblon, that white jersey. He's the rider who won so well at Alp d'Huez. He's very much in the hunt for the King of the Mountains. He sits in fifth place and he is 93 points in the competition to 108 of Pierre Roland. Yes, but I still in the back of my mind have a feeling, Phil, we're going to see a massive chase by Team Movistar and they've proved over the last couple of days in the mountains that they are strong enough to work and pull back breakaways like this. But 10 men working together is going to make it very difficult to pull back. Two riders from Uskadel, Uskadi, the riders from uh, Basque, Spain. Uh, that team has not had a stage win at this year yet, and they put two men into this breakaway, including their team leader, Igor Anton. And just trying to catch up here is the lotter rider, Greg Henderson. Now he's normally the lead out man uh, for uh, Andre Greipel, and it looks as though he's been given the green light to go and see what he can do himself. Just seeing Greg there, the, he's the New Zealand rider. His countryman Jack Bauer had a really nasty crash yesterday in his first Tour de France. Yeah, in fact, he crashed into a barbed wire fence uh, on the descent of the uh, Col, de, Col de la Madeleine and he crashed and he had eight stitches in his lip, two in his forehead and one in his chin. But the doctor said on first examination they couldn't see any fractures, although once the swelling has gone down, they might find something. But as far as they're concerned, he should be fine to pick up towards the end of the season and we wish him luck. Absolutely we do the face of the yellow jersey for two weeks he's led this race he took the lead on the saturday two weeks ago chris Froome. he knows if he's in yellow tonight he'll take it to paris tomorrow with a lead at the moment of five minutes and 11 seconds over his nearest rival there's the winner from yesterday and down in gappy won both tactics the same breaking away on the last climb of the day holding them off in the late dash to the finishing line I think at the moment this whole team is looking after their man in white here, the youngster, and they would love to see him get a stage win. Now, this is an attack here for the points available, only two plates, two places, two points and one point. Well, a little bit of a first attack there as they uh, started, it's uh, Gauthier on the front, 
Gauthier on the front in the green jersey, just behind him in the polka dot, that's Pierrot. Igor Anton is in the orange. And just uh, move, moving out of the picture there, Christophe Riblon, who is well up in the top five in this competition too. And they're looking around every corner thinking, where is the next point going to be? Oh, look at this, Igor Anton has gone through on the... He's leaned pretty heavily on Igor Anton, Pierre Roland. Looks over his shoulder, he's going to kick again and try and get in his slipstream. Igor Anton surprising us a little bit, he's no interest by winning the top of this climb. Yes, but his teammate Terniev is in third place in that competition, which is why Igor Anton has gone out to get those points and take them away from the Frenchman. And that leads me to think that perhaps Nida is being kept, his powder kept dry for the last climb of the day to win the stage, win the 50 points and take the King of the Mountains on the very last climb going to leave a little bit of suspense in that King of the Mountains competition uh, there are only two points available on tomorrow's stage so that's why it's very very important to get cracking today later rebuilt on the hills of the Semnoz the old city is split by the river Tu, a natural overflow of the lake of Annecy and features many medieval roads piers and squares and also features numerous covered passages built mainly to provide access to the old mansion houses there's the beautiful river and uh, that's where the riders stayed last night before they started this morning that was the old prison there as the riders now get back onto the action they've been splitting up in this league group and reforming since they came over the top of the Col de la Show. here's all the front runners for you and there are ten of them yep and uh, the most dangerous in there is Pierre Roland he, he's battling fighting out for the uh, key lead in the King of the Mountains he's actually just taken that virtually on the road he's got 109 points to Chris Froome's 104 but uh, we've got two riders from Uskatel Uskadi in this breakaway group as well and they're in there to try and take the points away from him because their teammate uh, Mikel Nieve is in third place in that competition just left the, the department of the Haute Savoie we'll be going back with the big finish of course we've now entered Savoie as uh, we continue now heading towards a sprint and then Le Châtelard is where we have the sprint then the next climb is the Aeon Le Vieux then over Mont Revoir and finally of course that big climb of saint where there are a lot of people waiting to see the Tour de France because many of the people today down at the start and there were thousands of people at the start on the lake this morning have, have got the opportunity Paul today to move on to the mountain now what a, what a chance that is for people coming out to support the tour. I have to say, Phil, I think the uh, climb of Mont Revar at 16 kilometres and 5.5% is where the race will start to toughen itself up. I don't see the decision actually being made there. I think it will all go down to the last 10 kilometres up to the summit of Semnoz. It's a very difficult climb with an average gradient of 8.5%. Well, this is the whole team of Movistar here, including the rider in the white jersey, the young rider of... Uh, Nero Quintana has ridden a terrific tour in his first Tour de France. He's fighting for a podium and currently sits in third place. Very fragile third place, but he may have the guns to finish it off and confirm it when we get to the Semnos today. Uh, that faster uh, tempo is holding the escape and limiting its move. That's the riding at a minute 10 seconds at the moment. Froome may win this Tour de France by the end of this day, but look at the others, Paul. Yeah, we'll have a look at this. Alberto Contador down to Nairo Quintana, 11 seconds. Quintana down to Kruziger, just 12 seconds. And then from second to Rodriguez, you're looking at 47 seconds. It's going to be a huge battle, and it will go down to the last 10.7 kilometres of the climb today. So we will see some fireworks, and it's not yet. It's not the 4th of July anymore. No, and, it, you know, even if they move with a kilometre to go, they can open that sort of a gap and go from fifth to second in the Tour de France. Only three get to be presented on the podium tomorrow and it'll be in the dark because it's going to be a finish around 10 o'clock in the evening. What a Technology certainly drives the sport and before we get started here I want to just reconfirm to everyone this is not Bob Roll's current kit. <laughs> this is not stuff that he's using right now but Scotty the technology has just grown exponentially over the years and you've got a few little items here that hard to believe that's what they used to use. It is actually really hard to believe especially if you look at this shoe here it's it's almost like a, a house slipper in terms of how flexible it is and honestly the reason they did that is because these guys would end up doing a lot of walking over the tops of these passes whereas today's technology is more like you know it's very very rigid it holds your foot more like a ski binding uh, to sort of 
situation. So this is um, just unbelievable. And this was actually the current shoe from probably early 1900s until about 1970s, early 80s, and when we saw a switch to more of a, a lock-in system like this. And the other thing is just the, the weight and the materials that, are, that were used. We see titanium, carbon fiber, aluminum, those kind of things. Now we're just looking at a lot of steel back in the day, very, very heavy. And again, just not a very secure system for where a lot of the power would have gone into the, the pedals. Probably the, the biggest difference, I think, here is the, the eyewear. I mean, these, these are goggles. This is, again, from the early 20s, early 30s. It's because, oh, here we go, here we go. <laughs> it's because uh, of all the dust. You know? I might have missed my era. <laughs> there you go, there you go. The dust that would be kicked up by the cars and the other cyclists, they actually needed something that would, would be more like a goggle uh, as opposed to a glass. Uh, these were actually official Tour de France um, issued glasses back in the 1950s. Now, you did not get those from Ryder Hagedal last night, did you? Those, I did not those, not those get are these, literally. Yeah, Ryder Hagedal was, was way ahead of his time. I guess, Take a look, because those look an awful lot like what we saw yesterday on Le Grand Bornon. The Ryder out there rocking the. Going know, retro. The, the Charlie Angels look or something. <laughs> eventually, they're not Oakley issues, is what you're telling me. Eventually, everything comes back in style, and, and Ryder is certainly the first guy to, to bring those around. So, And uh, then finally, the headgear. This yeah. I love. Not protective, not aerodynamic, <laughs> but very well ventilated. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to fall wearing this, believe me. What, what's inside there? Horse cork. hair. Just cork. horse hair. And cork. cork. And yeah. cork. Wow, that explains a lot with Bob. Uh, <laughs> did you wear this a lot when you were riding or actually, anything similar to that? Actually, we were required to wear hair nets. They were a little bit more advanced. Just, they moved the leather panels so they <laughs> came across your head. But, yeah, just uh, not, uh, not great. And in, in the very early years, they wouldn't wear helmets at all. I mean, it was mostly yeah. just yeah. a cap just to keep the sweat out of the eyes and that kind of thing. As you guys are former pro racers, I'll start with you, Scotty. What has been the biggest advancement of technology, do you think, in the world of professional cycling? Oh, I think, without a doubt, it's been carbon fiber. You know, carbon fiber came from the, the car racing technology probably 12, 15 years ago and it's completely changed the landscape you know first it was steel then it was aluminum then it went on to titanium but carbon has just changed the fact that you can make something very very light very very rigid and, and, and very aerodynamic all at the same time and bob for you well it's the materials that the riders race and they're so streamlined so aerodynamic it's almost no material in the wind the heavy wools have gone and they've given way to really advanced lycra that breathes well and is incredibly lightweight yeah, I mean, if you think about this this pedal and, and toe clip right here, it's basically a boat anchor. I mean, this thing yeah. alone weighs as much as a front carbon fiber wheel. It's, it's really ironic that yesterday, I'm sorry, the Alpe West stage, they were talking about weighing the, the riders' bikes and how they needed to, to be under or up, up to a certain weight limit. And now, I mean, back in the day, bikes were probably 40, 45 pounds. They had very, very limited gears. I mean, guys are running now today with either 20 or 22 gears. Uh, back in the day, we're talking three or four gears at, at best. And right now, we're watching the start of a Category 3 climb, 54.3 three miles to go and guys as you look at the technology and advancements Scott you talked about it the carbon fiber Bob you talked about the, the materials they're using I mean you think about a bike like let's say a Pinarello Dogma with some NV wheels ultra ultra light but very very stiff because obviously what goes up has to come down yeah, and the, and the bikes handle so well, too. I mean, we used to see very, very large fork rakes, and just the geometry was, was much different, was more built for comfort, um, because the guys were on the, the road sometimes three and 400 kilometers a stretch, and now everything's been condensed, so that, you know, the longest you're going to be on the bike is maybe five, six hours, so the bikes have become not maybe as comfortable, but certainly um, just more efficient. It was getting direct power to the, the pedals, and, and again, lightweight and made very, very well handled. And before we hand it back to Phil and Paul, Bob, I'll ask you, because I love throwing you the curveballs, where do you think the next advancements will come from? Can they make the bikes any lighter? Because we do have a limit of how light they can be. Well, I think for safety reasons, the UCI has put an upper limit on the weight of a bicycle, just right over 15 pounds, 15 pounds in an ounce. But I think now they could go a couple of pounds less than that without sacrificing any safety whatsoever. So maybe if the UCI loosens up their rules a little bit, we'll see even lighter weight bikes. Seems to be a trend also to things going electronic. I think we're not too far away from probably a wireless electronic group. Oh, right now they have a wired electronic group, which is still kind of the jury's out whether or not that's, that's the the, uh, the current rage, but I think that's probably where it's going to go. Just get away with all the wires together. It's going to make it a cleaner, more aerodynamic, and also just a more reliable system. So everything will just go Wi-Fi, and, and maybe eventually you'll just send a signal from your brain to your rear derailleur, and it'll change <laughs> the gears for you. And, Phil, you can rest assured that we'll make sure that uh, Paul gets back his uh, helmet, and we'll get Ryder Hayes all back his glasses. Me to it there, Todd. Well, make sure you put my shoes and pedals back in my suitcase as well. Well, guys, that was very interesting how times have changed there. As we're looking at the race here, we're on the, the third climb of the day now, the Côte de Déon Le Vieux. Le Vieux. Uh, they've still got these 10 riders, but they're just over a minute ahead of the field, so the field is continuing uh, to keep everybody in their sights today, and I think there's a plan, and I think we'll get the basic of that plan when we get onto the slopes of Mont Revar, uh, which is. Uh, kilometer to the summit of this the climb of the Aion Le Vieux 
and we're certain to see the polka dot jersey go for this but he could win all 21 points on the offer today which he can't do because he was second in the last climb and still lose the race in the final spin 50 points for the end of the day yeah but what a way to go down fighting like this he's put everything into uh, his chances to try and win but he will get challenged i'm sure phil by uh, igor anton again because anton is trying to chip away to make sure pierre roland doesn't get too many points with the hope that his teammate uh, Mikel Nieve gets some points on the final climb of the day. Double points because it's an outside categorised climb right at the very end. They double the points on four mountaintop finishes in the Tour de France this year to spice up the competition a bit. Yeah. Well, we drove up most of the climb today. It's in a beautiful part of the world, I must say, as it comes up here. We've never been up here before. They're very close now, these leaders. They're just about to start the sprint and going off down the road. He's just slipped away. We just about see him, I think, as he's come through the finishing line there. He gets the couple of points available. Looks like uh, Riblon will get the one. But you saw how Gauthier was trying to challenge Riblon to make sure that he didn't get any points. It's so close, that competition, at the top end of the leaderboard. And it's going to be a battle right the way down to the final climb of the day. So another two points for Christophe Roland, bringing his score today uh, to eight. And a lead at the moment in the King of the Mountains competition. But there's 50 on offer for the man that wins the stage. By the end of this day, he's going to hope the, uh, it all formulates and works out to his advantage. They've got to, after that sprint now, get themselves organised and start to working together again because if they don't and they start messing around like this with no organisation and the pace it's being doing, they'll get caught by the main field who are now uh, back inside of the one-minute margin again. Doesn't seem to be moving at all. It's just locked in. Once they go over the summit of uh, the Col des Prés, they will drop down to uh, saint jean d'Arvé and then that's the start of the uh, next big climb and I reiterate the big climb because the Moravar is 16 kilometres long yes and that big peloton, peloton is going to disintegrate on this climb and we're hearing that Cameron Meyer has just punctured back in the main field for the Oracle Green Edge he's on the same team as Simon Clark in that lime green stripe on his jersey there well, there's Pierre Roland in this polka dot jersey, leader of the King of the Mountains, being led there by his teammate uh, Cyril Dodgier. And behind him is Igor Anton. Anton's going to try and outfox him here if he can. And he's the rider in the orange jersey. They're approaching the finishing line here of the third category climb, the Col des Prés which takes them up to 51 kilometers done it in the race and it's taking on here a little bit of bad riding there by Pierre Roland as he tries to block out and I think he'll get uh, disqualified from the first place if he gets it for that sprint because he took his man right across the road as if he didn't know he was there that was a little bit nasty there and a little word, word coming from Igor Anton uh, about the move up that was uh, he was jumping out of the slipstream of his teammate but he did yeah, go no, very very far across difference. the road that's I think um, the, uh, if the referees are watching this, I think they might see a little bit of a relegation coming from that one. Well, we'll wait to see what they say. Uh, at the moment, Roland gets the two points. Because actually, Phil, I think uh, Anton would have gone by him if he hadn't gone across the road like that. Little words of explanation. A heated moment uh, because of that. Yes, well... He said it very politely, I must think, uh, there, that Igor Anton went up. The reason that Igor Anton is trying to get the points, not for himself, uh, but to take the points uh, over to his teammate, who is not in the breakaway, Nieve, because we have a feeling that it might that Mikel Nieve is planning an assault on the last climb today to try and win the stage. There's 50 points at stake. It would give him the King of the Mountains. And can you imagine the risks that uh, Pierre Roland took there, Phil, for just a mere two points in this competition? And it could go down to two points, and that's why it was so important for him to battle it out there. Oh, Tony, well, well, he's broken his here? chain. He's broken his chain. Yeah, and that you don't see very often in this day and age. Well, the chains have purred down so thin now, uh, and the breakage of chain is much more common than it used to be in the old days, that's for sure. There's the peloton over the top. At the moment, they're announcing Roland is uh, the winner of that sprint, Riblon in second place. Well, I think that's before the judges have had a quick look at uh, the video replays. Uh, this is at the back end of the main field, and look at that, yeah. no chain. Well, 
so he couldn't really keep riding until the team manager came up alongside him it was a quick stop and they will lose a little bit of time there as they figure out where his bike is well for the moment the race is not exactly uh, charging across the Savoir countryside here he's got away he's got a new bike and he's on the climb of the Col de Pré. So as we see uh, Galapan make his way forward, let's go a little bit down to the race now and join in with Steve Prieno. He's inside the race with Tyrac.com. Steve. Well, Phil, we just passed Tolly Galapan's bike with the broken chain, and it reminded me of part of the conversation uh, in the Sky Bus last night to give us an idea of just how detailed their analysis goes, particularly with equipment. They have discovered that by running a chain in, at some point in its life, it has the least amount of resistance. At that point, they take the chains off the bike, put them in a Ziploc bag, hang on to them until the day when they want to bust them out, and it matters. Wow, well, that's interesting, Steve. As uh, we've seen now, unfortunately for Tony Gallopan, he's had to change bikes and continue on. We're back up with the leaders here. Uh, no news uh, from uh, the race referees about uh, any disqualification there. Uh, what they would have normally have done would have replaced Roland uh, behind uh, Anton in the sprint finish. But anyway, no news on that. It's only for two points anyway. As we continue on our way, the next challenge of the day is the big one before the finish. The long climb of Mont River. Uh, the Odeurs are behind us now on this 20th day of the Tour de France, our last day in the high mountains. And the next high mountain to come our way is Mont Rivard. And it is now just about three miles ahead of the breakaway. No further news on uh, who won that last sprint. They're confirming Roland uh, did get the better of Anton, although I would have thought that the referees would have reversed that. But as we watch it going down the hill now, these are the 10th leaders as they push on. The breakaway still closing in on them. Around about 53 seconds is the gap uh, as they are still descending away down now. Well, about, uh, just about five kilometres now, Paul, to the start of the climb of Mont Revoir. Did you ever ride over this climb yourself? I can't remember, actually, if the truth be known. No, I don't think I ever did, but I, I do know it was very, very famous. as a brilliant photograph of Eddie Merckx uh, winning at the top of here when he's got his hand up in the air because he thought he'd won the stage. Mm -hmm. Underneath his arm came <laughs> Cyril Guimard to get the victory in a photo finish from Eddie Merckx. And uh, who would ever think that Eddie Merckx would uh, make a mistake like that? But even top professionals to this day still make that mistake of thinking they've got the victory so easily. And oops, what a mistake. Quite Guimard, embarrassing. Yeah, Cyril Guimard is, uh, works on the race now as a radio uh, reporter, has his own programme every night on French radio. And he was a very, very good sprinter. He won the green jersey in the Tour de France. And won more than 250 professional races uh, over a career. But he was uh, reputed, he was renowned for actually uh, using too big a gear in the mountains. And in mm. fact, at the end of the day, it was uh, his tendons that gave out and he had to retire. And he became a very, very good team manager. He was team manager for Bernard Hino, Lucien Van Impe, yeah. and of course, found riders like uh, Laurent Fignon and Greg Lemond. These uh, are the four leaders in our camera site at the moment with uh, Roland on the back. They've split on the way down. We're heading now. We should be on the lower slopes at around 62 kilometres to go. So just under four kilometres to the start of the river. And it, it is a very steep climb. So I would th think this breakaway will crack up pretty much immediately. They get onto the climb. Well, being a might have cracked up now. We've got a split here. Well, being a first category climb, there are points for the first five riders to go over the summit, and there are ten points for the first man over the top. And the problem is still Goche. No, he wants a drink. Well, Simon Clark, who's putting the hammer down at the front of this group, he obviously went down there quite quickly, joined by Juan Antonio Fletcher. And you can see a little bit by the uh, by the body language of these riders here that this has been a long, hard Tour de France, and these guys, even on this slight incline here, are finding it quite tough. This could be a little move here by Olika Greenish to take advantage of team tactics. Simon Clark is a known climber. He's out of the hunt for the King of the Mountains. He's gone into the breakaway right from the gun. 
and it could well be he'll test the strength of the breakaway on the lower slopes of Brevard because he can't afford to uh, not race up the Brevard now. The gap is not growing from the peloton. But Annika Greenedge had that wonderful work first week with two different riders on the team wearing yellow. Uh, a stage win is what they're looking for now. Igor Anton at the front here. Cyril Gauthier second. Jens Voigt on the far right. Spurkhardt in his yellow shoes. Gap starting to come down again. Uh, 51, saying 53. It's still hovering, but very shortly, uh, Mobistar are going to take complete control of this race and I think try and pull them back into the fold once we actually start the more of our proper... It's always a bit of a... Today, Fletcher's up there, but I'm not so sure he will be at the end. Uh, the leaders are in saint jean d'Arve now. And um, right onto the lower slopes come the Movistar team. Everybody will start to twitch a little bit now. Who is going to move? The tempo is picking up. It's a long way to the top of this climb. Officially, we're on the climb, Paul, but it takes a little while before we start to actually start the climb on the steep sections. Yep. That's a very long climb. That's 15.9 uh, kilometres. That's almost 10 miles of uphill. That's going to take them about 45 minutes on the day. The face of uh, Cyril Gautier. Now, there's a lot of combinations, uh, possible combinations here, Paul. Do you think we're going to see an attack from the peloton for those riders who are so closely bunched? No, I think the guys who are looking for, to fight out for the podium, Phil, they will make their attacks on the final climb of the day because we're only looking seconds. 47 seconds are separating the second place rider to the fifth place rider and only 10 and 11, 12 seconds separating second from third, third from fourth. So really it's in the final part of the final climb of the day. Just as a point of interest, I was telling you about that race that Eddie Merckx thought he'd won at the summit of the climb here in Moravar where he's beaten by Cyril Guimard. That in fact was the shortest stage of the Tour de France ever at just 28 kilometers. <laughs> Goodness. Jens Voigt is putting the hammer down first of all and he's caused a reaction from Cyril Gauthier. This boy will never stop. He's not a climber. I don't quite know what you call Lentz apart from a very aggressive professional cyclist. That I think uh, really that, that sums it up, Phil. He is aggressive, uh, but he likes to go out and race. And he will continue to be a professional cyclist, he says, as long as he can dictate the pace to some of the guys in this event and not be subject to being punished by other riders and right now he's probably looking at that very famous uh, mo motto of his which is down the top of his uh, crossbar on the bike which says shut up legs <laughs> well he boosts the viewing figures in Germany because he's got a family of uh, six children and they all watch dad in action and now they're getting the best possible shot here he has split this leading group surprisingly it's Astolosa and Igor Anton who are in the back group and, and Pierre Roland. And Pierre Roland has gone as well because this man, a beastie boy this afternoon, Jens Voigt proving why he also has the other nickname, the King of Pain. Because he dishes it out. It. He's gone up there. Gautier has gone up forward as well and so has Pavel Brut, the Katusha rider. They weren't expecting this uh, quite at the beginning and there's Pierre Roland was not reckoning on a big attack at the base of the climb. You've got a surprise that Igor Anton has missed this split because of the speed of Jens Voigt. Roland is conserving energy today, perhaps because he's still got the finishing climb to come when he knows there's 50 points at the top as well as the first prize in the King of the Mountains. Jens Pavel is Brut cracking is gone. everybody. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Pavel Brut has been dropped now. It's not ridiculous. It's fabulous <laughs> to watch Jens Voigt <laughs> racing like this. He's even putting a little bit of daylight between himself and Simon Clark, who by, uh, by uh, definition is not a bad climber at all. Well, I would say there's only one and a half guys trying to get into the breakaway here because look at Simon Clark. He's really having to dig deep to get onto the wheel of Jens Voigt. Well, Jens Voigt has worn the King of the Mountains jersey. He wore it for a day back in 1998. And uh, as we're now seeing TJ van Gorderen move away from the front and Philippe Gilbert has moved up alongside him, the world champion. Well, you see, there's no response to the move by these two riders because they're so far down in the long, uh, in the overall classification. And it's uh, being left up to the riders from Movistar to keep the pace making. But that acceleration by Jens Voigt has extended his lead over the main field of the yellow jersey to a minute and 17 seconds. 
Well, he's won two stages of the Tour de France, but he's never won a mountain stage. We'll see how this develops now. This could be a very interesting race pattern because, again, with the second, third, fourth and fifth rider separated by seconds, there's a lot of infighting going on to establish the final order going into Paris tomorrow. If you're feeling strong today and you've lost time, as TJ Van Garderen has, it could be a very, very good move by the American rider to try and go and join the lead. Voigt is now dropping Clark. I can't believe this, but Jens Voigt has now just got rid of everybody in the breakaway because Simon Clark has fallen back. No, he's a beast when he gets into a stage like this. He knows there's only one stage left. This is a big chance for him to break the stranglehold of the main field. And it's going to take uh, the whole of Movistar together to work to pull Jens Voigt back because he's now started to pull away again. One and a half minutes. Well, we're watching here Jens Voigt, who uh, is not just a star of the Tour de France, he's also a star of the United States. You may remember when the stage of the Amgen Tour of California. Well, don't forget, uh, coming up on your screens in the month of August will be the USA Pro Challenge. The climb of uh, Semnoz is as steep as Alpe d'Huez. It is the same gradient and it is a very, very vicious climb indeed. All of those leaders are in fact, oh, here we go back up to the leaders now, and here come those four riders, and TJ Van Gorden is beginning to eat through them now, as they're getting to the midway point on the climb of uh, Mont River. Now, there he is on the right, TJ Van Gorden, just come up, Roland takes a double take, sees him come by. Does Roland have any legs left to join in? Well, isn't it quite uh, intriguing because the man just on the back of that group, Christophe Riblon, is the rider who was uh, who caught and passed TJ Van Garden on the slopes of the Alpe d'Huez. Van Garden very much seems to have recovered from that uh, defeat. And I think we'll see him stronger when he comes back next year. He's learned a lot of about himself this year. And as he said, he still qualifies for the best young rider competition. But he said next year, I won't be able to use that as an excuse. No. Still Voigt up front, chased by Anton. Brut and Clark are in there somewhere as well, around about 45 seconds back. And then we've got the group we've seen, where TJ Van Garden is still looking to make up a minute 20 to contact this man. So, as Jens Voigt gets on with his job, let me remind you, on Wednesday, July the 31st... The this is off the top of the Finnish mountain as we go back down on the action on Mont Revar here. Riblon up in front of uh, and the back comes this group here so they've read they've swelled up just that little bit Gilbert is back in the action so they must have slowed down so this is interesting because TJ Van Gaard Van Gaard on the left number 39 has got his world champion teammate alongside him Pierre Roland has waited to see Cyril Gautier his teammate number 54 rejoin him at the front Haval Brut, number 102, and Simon Clark. Well, I'm a little bit surprised about that. They seem to slow down in the pursuit of the climb, and this man is still doing his best. Behind him is Igor Anton, who had no pictures of him, yet he's closed the gap to just 28 seconds to Jens Voigt. Almost exactly two minutes back to these riders now, as Pierre Roland hanging on in there. It's a first category climb. He would like to try and pick up some points on this climb. He's got a big bunch of riders to take him on. Well, a lot of work there being done by Cyril Gauthier. You can see in the green jersey just ahead of the world champion, number 34. And that's to try and keep this group off the front end of the main field before we summit the Morivar to give uh, Pierre Roland a chance to get himself a couple more points. Here he comes. This is the first time we've seen him since he started the climb of Morivar. And that's because he is now closing in very, very quickly on Jens Voigt. So the climber... Uh, from northern Spain, catching up with the non-climber, if you like, from Germany. He's looking around those corners, wondering when he's going to see the shadow of the big German, but on these uh, narrow little mountain roads, there's not too many straight roads to see that gap of 250 metres or so. Just going around the corner, I spotted Jens, though. Now, let's see if we can pick him up. There he is down there. Officially, the time gap is about 15 seconds at the moment for them. Well, I would say, Phil, that that actually appears to me to be a little bit more than 15 seconds. I would say it's probably still fairly close to the 20 or 25 second mark. The Gens won't give up. 
and won't slow down until Igor Anton is in his slipstream. That story off I was telling you about Bradley McGee, who was a teammate of Jens Voigt, the Australian, and he said he was riding alongside Jens Voigt in the Tour of Germany once, and Jens Voigt was saying, come on Jens, you're strong enough, you can do this, you can do this, and he did. <laughs> and he's probably saying that right now. Uh, Bradley, uh, yes, uh, Brad McGee says he doesn't age, he's an absolute freak. Well, he has the right to say it, they're mates. An amazing ascent now by Jens Voigt, and take your hat off to the oldest man in the Tour de France as he heads up now to top Mont Revard, the last first category climb of this year's Tour de France. He's going to get maximum points in the King of the Mountains, and it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's the show, it's the spectacle, it's the panache of a guy like Jens Voigt at 41 years of age coming to the summit of this climb. And I wonder if we'll see him back at the Tour de France again next year because he said if he gets another contest, Contract will then race even at 42 years of age. Well, he doesn't want pushes because actually, although he's not asking for a push, the referees will penalise him for that. He's got a superb rhythm going. Uh, this is what he doesn't want to see. But see, he's, he's pushed that that hand away from him. Here, all the cowbells are. Well, we're not in Switzerland here. In fact, the Savoie region is very well known for cattle and milk and cheese and those are the cowbells that you hear very often around the cow's necks in these high mountains just around the corner Jens Voigt is going to top out and he's not going to ease up either a little check over his shoulder it's a good downhill descent now and then it runs across the valley to a little town called Cantal and that's where they start the climb to the finish of the mountains in this year's Tour de France Jens Voigt will not wait for anybody he's going for the win over the top of that mountain there, Jens Voigt is a star on today's stage. And you know, he's, he's pulling away from the nine-man chasing group behind him that contains Burkhardt, Gilbert and Van Garderen. They are now at 2 minutes and 22 seconds to the German, and they're only hovering a minute in front of the main field. At 10 points. Thanks very much indeed, Tom. We look forward to that. Uh, the 41-year-old child, I like that, because that's what he is. If you know Jens Voigt really well, this man is always joking, laughing, and yet he's such a real bike racer he's still leading the race too as we head down towards the last challenge of the Alps the climb up to the finish in Semnos he continues to rattle down Mont Revoir here and he's continuing to ride at pretty high speed he's holding all of his advantages and Igor Anton who almost came up to him has gone back out to 45 seconds back Anton had to make the contact with Jens Voigt, Phil, I feel, on the slopes of the climb. He's a slightly built rider, he's a very good climber, and it was using the climb that he needed to catch the big German here. Jens is very happy to ride on his own. We saw him win a, a stage in uh, the USA Pro Challenge in uh, Colorado last year in a similar kind of move, but I'm not sure he's going to pull that off here at the Tour de France this afternoon because his final climb of the day really is quite scary at uh, 11 kilometres or 7 miles of climbing, and it's a much steeper gradient it's got gradients as high as nine and a half percent though there's a problem here this looks like it's contador oh well no it's not no it's no, not it's not it's, 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 it's just again. as important right now because he's one of the riders split by 47 seconds blanketed second to fifth he's fourth overall just putting what came out of the car and was uh, splattered all over the road there pushed him in it's a very good change in the end he's on the way down now we'll see if anybody has been sent back by the team to bring uh, Roman Kruziger back up or whether they're leaving them all around Alberto Contador risk to be taken to get down without hopefully using too much energy because once across the valley then the battle begins as to who finishes second and third in the Tour de France well Kruziger is only 12 seconds off a podium position at the end of uh, the Tour de There's France this waiting for him well that's not a surprise uh, no. that he needs to conserve as much energy as possible Voigt has got himself uh, down into that low profile uh, aerodynamic position keeping his pace uh, in excess of 55 miles an hour on this descent and as you can see Kruziger teammate there just putting his hand down a fraction to say take it calm let's not overcook it in these corners because on the penultimate day of the Tour de France with a mountain top finish you don't want to go down because that really would ruin your chances well he needs a little bit of help and he's got it here from his teammate 
which is uh, Daniela Bonatti, surprisingly enough, so he must have come back on the descent himself after being dropped. Another teammate come back now. And another one. <laughs> Just about, he hasn't gone on yet. That's it, so they are rating this man, they want to give him his finest ever finish in the Tour de France. Uh, because this rider coming back is Nicholas Roach here, who's now tacking on. Yep. Roach has been a solid worker for this uh, Saxo Tinkoff squad. He wanted to make the transfer uh, last winter to a team like this, a top team on the international circuit, because he felt he could uh, lend his weight in the big mountains as an extremely good helper. Tassato is the other rider here, and down the bottom here, that's a really sharp, that is a really look at what has just happened as they came down that sharp right-hander. The peloton are going to have to watch that one. Well, I think they will probably have been watching that Oop. on... Oh, Philippe Zubert has got that a problem. Tire? Oh, that no, tire or no gear trouble? Gear trouble. Looks almost identical problem to what TJ Van Gorderen had on yeah. the descent of the Serenity. Yeah, he's trying to correct it himself, and uh, what's happened is the, the gear is, should come round the back. It's a jam chain, or it's jammed on the gear shifts there. The big question is, uh, is the team car right behind him as the, the referee's going by? The referee's are in the red car there as Philippe Joubert trying to fix it himself. And um, with the gap between uh, this group and the main field uh, at around about a minute and a half, you would presume that his team car would be behind him. But because they got away on the climb, the team car, well, there's the team car, so they'll have to have a new bike quite quickly. It's a new bike. Well, it's a bit chaotic. And this is exactly what happened to TJ Van Gogh on his quest to win on Alp d'Huez. And many people feel that the chase to rejoin and then go forward likely cost him the victory there because his strength left him just a kilometre from the summit. So as you watch Jens Voigt here, let me remind you, the NBC Sports Fantasy Cycling Challenge goes on. You can still sign up and select your teams. And this year, thanks to thefeed.com, if you win, Christian van der Vel will come to your home and go for a ride. Today's feature prize is a signed Garmin Sharp racing kit. It's all at nbcsports.com slash challenge. Jens Voigt still blowing a lone trail down the mountain. He almost overshot one corner, but he's all right. And he's continuing to lead this race. Virtual unchanged time gap since the top of the climb. Three minutes, 19 seconds to the main field. The chase group, which now includes Igor Anton of nine, has closed slightly to one minute 41. Well, they're getting it together now, Paul. They've pulled off about nine seconds, uh, those nine riders chasing Jens, but the peloton has lost a bit of ground again. Well, that's amazing when you think that you've got really two teams uh, putting some pacemaking in the front. We've left all of the difficulties behind us so far. We've been through the sprint point. We've been through five climbs so far. All that is left on the horizon is the HC, the all category, outside categorized climb, the climb up to Semnoz. Jens Voigt, he gets closer, but not yet on the last climb of the day. The crowd are loving seeing him. Let's go! 2.49, Paul, it's all closing in. Jens Voigt approaches this last climb. He's still about seven kilometers away. The chase of nine is closing in. The peloton is closing in. It's all coming together for the last descent. Very, very touch and go for Jens Voigt uh, as to whether or not he will survive. Uh, there is that very old famous bridge I was telling you about, the uh, Pont de l'Abîme. Just waiting to see if the main field are going to come charging across that any moment. What a magnificent sight as we start to begin our way up the climb here. We've rejoined now the Haute Savoie region. Yes, the depth uh, down there from the bridge down to the valley floor is almost 100 meters 96 meters to be exact and the span is 74.8 meters across a drink taken by Margus Burkhardt job done as he leaves the breakaway now he's done all the pacemaking he can BMC have made it quite apparent they are trying to springboard a situation here for TJ Van Gorderen he's certain to attack as soon as we get onto the slopes of Mont Revoir. then he's got to catch up with Jens Voigt well, he has to, Phil, because uh, the main 
field the main peloton are around about one and a half minutes behind this group uh, 115 is the gap between uh, Jens Voigt and the now eight-man chase group there discarded by the breakaway and uh, quickly spotted by the bunch and cause serious accident as they roll around the road Jens Voigt uh, moving up the road again now as he comes in uh, to the the stage town which would take us to the uh, this is the town of Gruffy and the next town is Vieux La Chaises uh, and then we're starting the climb Gilbert. Look at this yeah. now, he's dragging TJ to that man. This is not a, a race to the finish, this is a race just to the start of the climb, as far as Gilbert is concerned. Pretty impressive when you see a world champion uh, turning round and doing a work as a teammate, and he's doing that because he knows he cannot climb as well as his teammate number 39 there, TJ Van Garderen. Cyril Gauthier, number 54 in third place, he's also been doing a lot of work to try and help this breakaway group stay in front of the main field. The main field is making a real job of trying to catch these guys on the final few kilometres before we get to the start of the climb. Visibly going slower, I would suggest, here is the peloton. Chris Froome, with every pedal rev in that yellow jersey, knows he's going to his final destiny, his real last challenge in this year's Tour de France. If he's in yellow tonight, it's unlikely he will uh, be challenged tomorrow. But I'll tell you what, Paul, if we go to tomorrow's stage with this second, third, fourth and fifth race separated by just seconds, they will race tomorrow. Tradition will not dictate that they don't, for sure. This is still this is the back of the peloton at the moment. Well, tomorrow, of course, it is the highlight of three weeks of racing the racing that we've seen through the Pyrenees through the Alps and what a great week we've had in the Alps here the riders visibly tired but they go to Paris tomorrow and it's an evening race tomorrow yes for the first time in tour history we don't start racing till about quarter to six in the evening and that's local time of course in the Seine in France and then we will finish locally uh, around 10 o'clock in the evening when it will be dark uh, a very very nice finish plan for the Tour de France in its 100th edition Dan Martin two big names with, with Cadell Evans of the Tour de France now sitting at the back that's the wrong place to be as we start to look for the slopes of Semnoz Yep, it's going to get very, very difficult. Uh, Jens for uh, uh, Cadell Evans, Phil, I would think, will be very happy when this Tour de France is over. He said, well, thank goodness I managed to get third place overall in the Giro d'Italia. Celia Gauthier, here comes the move by TJ Van Garden. It's on the slope upwards, but we're not quite officially on the climb yet. But Van Garden's decided it is his time to make his play because the peloton is closing in and he's taking a roll on with him and the Vulios. Well, the breakaway, as they approach the lower slopes, they haven't yet started Semnoz, but the attacks certainly have. Yeah, but look at this, Phil, the gap is closing down very, very quickly to the yellow jersey group, and there it is. They're fractioning at the front end of the main field. It's uh, Konstantin Sivsov now who does the pacemaking for Chris Froome. Behind him, it's Richie Port, and they're all scrambling for the wheel of the Skytrain. Well, this is amazing. It has been Mobistar who set all of the pace, and it's the Sky Boys who have gone to the front as we head up to the last climb in the Alps. Is Chris Froome going to go out with a win at the top of this mountain? What a show of panache that would be. Philippe Gilbert looks over his shoulder. He's tried to set this up for his teammate, TJ Van Garderen, who's a little bit further up the road, but there's not very much time between them and the front end of the main field this afternoon. Moving up there into sixth position is the white jersey of Quintana. On his wheel in the blue jersey is Alberto Contador. Behind him, it's Jochen. Joaquin Rodriguez, and behind him, it's Krutiger. All of the guys in the top positions in the overall standings. 10.7 kilometers of climbing at an average gradient of 8.5%. With just 12 kilometers to go, a buffer of 5 minutes and 11 seconds, it's safe to say that Chris Froome has won the Tour de France, but is he going to try and win the stage as well? He's been the most dominant leader in years of the Tour de France because he's already won three stages of this three week race well let's not forget the battle for the podiums is going to be very close indeed these are the three chasers uh, Roland, TJ Van Garde, Vuermos they're just behind Jens Voigt 
but there's 47 seconds between second place in the Tour de France and fifth place in the Tour de France and that's what the battle will be all about today but look how small that peloton is going this is back up to the front now TJ Van Garderen goes again trying to steal the show for BMC and the United States Vulliers and Roland haven't really got the answer to that attack by TJ well he's now looking at 11.3 kilometers to go uh, is it nice not now the right time Phil for me to tell you that we haven't reached the start of the climb proper no it's just a steady slope but we're still looking for the banner that will say 10.7 kilometers on the climb of Semnoz Peter Velic 159 continuing here but the behind the Pez Kriakowski is 153 but behind the field Paul they just disintegrating under this pressure by Froome's team well that was Andrew Talansky as well with those two riders from Omega Pharma quick step and along this little false flat before we actually get to the start proper Team Sky have literally blown up the race Igor Anton has gone back rather quickly from the front here now and already uh, Team Sky have done the high speed this field is down to about 12 riders here David Lopez now is the Spanish rider on Sky who comes to the front to look after Chris Froome now one there's his banner 10.7 kilometers to go for Jens Voigt Jens Voigt it takes them to the foot of the last climb in the Alpine mountains of the week and this is a climb no one's been up before in the Tour de France TJ Van Garden's been picked up by the two Frenchmen Pierre yeah, Roland there one must be wondering have I got a chance to survive off the front end of the peloton this afternoon because he needs to get himself into the top five on today's stage if he wants to win that King of the Mountains classification but I think Team Sky are really trying to set something up for Froome here and look at the damage they have done at the moment it is Lopez the pacemaker then is Chris Froome and behind Chris Froome is faithful friend Richie Port waiting to take up the pacemaking when he's called through the white jersey of the youngster from Colombia Quintana they are now at 10.7 in this chase group uh, behind Jens Voigt well Jens Voigt is doing a sterling job there it's 43 seconds between Jens Voigt and the three chases and we don't yet have a gap back to the main field with the yellow jersey but I reckon it can't be very much more than 15 or 20 seconds Andy Schleck comes up behind Andrew Tolansky there as well as uh, Bacalons is up here too there we can see 10.7 well let's quickly go down to inside the race with Steve Perino well, Phil, I just had a two-second conversation with Team Sky. I asked if they might give Richie Port a chance. He looked at me, smiled. He said, maybe. <laughs> I wondered that myself, Steve. We're going to find out now because it's all action. Is it every man for himself on this last climb of this year's Tour de France of note? So, as we watch here, Movistar trying to get in front. Now, Paul, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've got Chris Froome. He's made the first move. He's shed all of his teammates. But normally now, we would see Richie Port in front of Chris Froome. Do you think he's setting it up for, for Richie to win the stage? Well, what a way that would be. What class that would show yeah. if he could do something like that. These two have worked so much together throughout this race that Richie Port may well be given the chance to try and get the stage victory for himself. Led to the top by Chris uh, they know each other so well they know each other's reactions they can read each other's body language maybe that's the secret of Team Sky this afternoon Port is up into third position in the line there's going to be many secrets revealed on this final climb today to the unknown summit of Semnos as far as the Tour de France is concerned and at the one man that they picked up those three so they've come up to the Pierre Roland TJ Van Garden who used his team to try and get him clear but he's got mixed up in a different type of uh, storm here as the yellow jersey comes up on his back wheel I was just thinking though uh, the, the ride being done by Jens Voigt cannot be underestimated it has been such a great performance well the man's a star it was 43 seconds his advantage uh, Andy Schleck is trying to get himself uh, back into the yellow jersey group he's struggling a fraction but he's riding better and better 10 kilometers to go and Voigt is still ahead of the Tour de France this man tried to win the greatest moment of his life this stage but the chase now is only 50 seconds behind and it includes the men that matter in the tour very very rarely do you see Jens Voigt with a grimace of pain quite as bad as that one but he knows what's happening behind him he knows he's got the best men in the Tour de France chasing him at 50 seconds he's going to put them into a spot of bother this afternoon as we now see this group being reduced very very dramatically 
of the riders in second, third, fourth and fifth. They're all beneath us now at 10 kilometres to go. The 47 second buffer, which covers Contador, Quintana, Kreuziger and Rodriguez. They are all here. Well, these are the men who are in. Uh, he was in the breakaway for a long time. He's being left behind at 10 kilometres to go. Now we're looking for this 10 kilometres, Phil. I would think we're looking at a climb of around about 25, 26 minutes. That's a long way to go. Jan Bakelans, the early couple of day hero when we were in Corsica, pulled on the yellow jersey in his first Tour de France. He's still in our camera lenses now. This is the battle as to who will finish second to fifth in the Tour de France. Uh, Chris Froome has shown us right now he's heading for victory tomorrow in Paris. Verde is now uh, burying himself. He is in the top ten in the overall standings himself for that phenomenal ride yesterday. He's up into ninth place. But you don't think about that when you're trying to help a teammate get onto the podium, get onto a higher step of the podium in the final kilometres of a stage of the Tour de France. We're 8.8 .8 kilometres to go. That's 5.5 miles. Rodriguez has gone forward. Kreuzinger is going backwards. The difference between them is 14 seconds. The blink of an eyelid when you're climbing a mountain as steep as this now, as he, Rodriguez in red, trying to hang on to second place overall, Alberto Contador. And then the sights now, Jens Voigt, what an incredible performance by this 41-year-old, but he's not going to have the fairy tale result. Well, Alejandro Valverde is the man doing the damage. It's still just 10 seconds to Jens Voigt. He will know once this is done that it's over, but he's the man who let the blue touch paper to start setting off the fireworks here this afternoon, and what a way to do it. But now we've got a great battle here. Valverde, by the way, throughout his career, has won 100 professional races. He's a great competitor here, not even thinking about himself. I'm sure he would love to win this stage, but he's got faith in the one man behind him and his own team in the white jersey. Nairo Quintana. When he had a mechanical problem, a broken wheel, he was in second place in this year's Tour de France. He lost 10 minutes that day and with it all hope. Now he's trying to ride for the man in white, his young new teammate, and try and get him on the podium in Paris, Quintana. He sits third at the moment, but he is only 12 seconds ahead of fourth, but Kreuzinger is gone. So he's just got to be worried about the location now of the rider in the red jersey, Rodriguez. Well, this is Bacalanza Molima there, number 164 but this is where the race is really happening now it's all Richie Port they're waiting to see when the rider in the white jersey there launches the attack because he has got such a vicious and vicious acceleration on the slopes of a climb Rodriguez on the other side is moving he's too he's gone through on the inside and Quintana's marking him because Rodriguez is the one man who can knock Quintana out of third place in the Tour de France and if Contador doesn't respond then Quintana will be looking for second place in the Tour de France well, Rodriguez, you see, Phil, let's not forget, Chris Froome doesn't need to chase those riders. No, he's got a bigger... But he is. But he's going to. This is the pride of the yellow jersey on his shoulders now. Look at Chris the speed Froome he's going, going to by. Win the stage. This man has accelerated with his familiar high cadence, and there's no reaction from the men behind him. Yes, but look at this, what these two riders in second and third position are doing. They are getting rid of Alberto Contador. You're looking there, Phil, at second and third in the overall standings at the end of the race. Look at this. He just jumps out of the saddle accelerates so quickly I think he got the nod there from Richie Port and said go for it mate well he goes and joins the front runners here he's on, he's behind the riders who currently occupy third and fifth in the Tour de France but they're going to be second and third unless Alberto Contador can cross that gap and here is Contador now uh, being watched over by Richie Port Contador is in great danger of losing second place in the Tour well there's only 26 seconds Rep separates Joachim Rodriguez from uh, Alberto Contador and he's at 47 seconds but this man now is trying to win the stage this is the steepest part of the climb 10.5% as Rodriguez and Quintana come back to the wheel of Chris Froome because if they can hold Chris Froome they will finish second and third you could be looking in the correct order of the first three riders in the Tour de France tomorrow in Paris but the other two have got to hold on to Chris Froome that may not be possible. That was a painful 10.5% gradient there for those riders. As uh, Now we've got Alberto Contador. He's 10 seconds behind that group in front of him. That means he's very, very close to losing his second place to Quintana. Quintana was only looking for 11 seconds at the start of the day. And Rodriguez looking for 47 to go into third place in the Tour de France. 
It could be off the podium for the two-time winner of the Tour, Alberto Contador. He get no help from Richie Port. And this is the other man who's suffering two Contador's teammate, Kreuzinger, started the day in fourth place. Could be finishing the day in fifth. Well, lots of damage. So there's uh, number 89, is the Riblon, the winner of the Alpe d'Huez, uh, Mollema. Fulsang, all riders in the top 10 in the overall standings. But Mollema really has suffered over the last few days. He's been holding down a, a slight sickness as Rodriguez is very happy to do the pacemaking. So too is Quintana. Yes, Mo Mollema and uh, Fulsang holding the highest ever finishing positions in the Tour de France. And that's where they probably will finish with their time gaps now. Sixth and seventh overall. This is Contador. He's left very lonely now, guarded by Sky with Richie Port. And after all of the weeks, he's held second place. He attacked downhill as well as uphill. This is Fulsang and Bauke Monima. Contador is losing his second place overall. Well, at the moment, Phil, Contador is 24 seconds behind the trio at the front of the race. So Rodriguez, Quintana and Froome. A little bit of a chat here. This is a replay, but this just happened. Well, Froome, Froome knows what's he, at stake. He knows what they're racing for. And he has no reason to work with these guys at all. As far as he's concerned, he's consolidating his position in the overall standings at this race. While Contador may well be just recovering a bit I because he's he pulled himself back to 22 seconds. And he won't get any help either from Richie Port. And Kruziger is actually riding himself back too because he's at 33 seconds just behind his team leader. He's coming up there behind Lopez, I think, as well, just up front. As Contador continues to race up towards, he's now, he is refining himself, he's getting into his own climbing rhythm now, after all of the short, uh, sharp accelerations, although the time gap he's saying, he's gone back to 27, 26 seconds behind. Well, Rodriguez knows he's got to look for 47 seconds to get himself above Alberto Contador in the overall standings. At the moment, he has 26 seconds. He has to defend at Contador. He's a proud rider from Madrid. He's won the Tour de France in the, in the past, and he really wants to get onto the podium this afternoon. We knew it would come down to this. There's still 6.7 kilometers to go to the summit, and I reckon that's uh, between uh, 17 and 22 minutes. As they still continue to climb. Well, Rodriguez is giving his all here. This is a phenomenal performance by this rider, Phil. He'd always said he wanted to come to the Tour de France. In fact, when his team wasn't uh, in the World Pro Tour schedule, he was thinking about changing teams so much he wanted to come to the Tour de France this year when his team at one point were possibly not going to be selected. Solansky there, 178. He's now sitting on the wheel of Richie Port. Roman Kruziger has job done for the day. He can do no more. Fifth place overall for Kruziger. He's got the advantage to stay above Bob Mau uh, Bauke Mollema behind him. But when you look at uh, Joaquim Rodriguez here, Paul, he's never enjoyed the Tour de France, but this year he said he wanted to come. He's only ridden it once before, back in 2010. He finished eighth when he was not really expected to do much more than that. He won the stage. Now he's back and he's about to finish third. And do you remember who he beat on that stage up to Mond? It was a certain Alberto Contador. He made an inspired jump from the pack. It's a very steep uh, climb up to the aerodrome at Mond. And an absolutely typical Rodriguez win. Looks like Froome is starting to contemplate. Look at the pain written all over the face of uh, Rodriguez here as he bobs the top end of his body. I have to say Quintana still looks very cool. We're ready, ready to make that move. I was expecting him to make the move. Maybe he's just happy to be up there in second place in the overall standings. Wants to match the move by Rodriguez there. Froome will very, very shortly be seeing the one kilometre to go banner. Just one kilometre left to go to the summit of this climb of Semnoz. Froome, his yellow helmet, his yellow jersey, his yellow handlebar tape. He is the leader of the Tour de France. He leads the race by, from Contador by 5 minutes 11 seconds. Contador has lost more than a minute. Froome is now going for the victory, the fourth stage victory. He's winning through the mountains of this tour as he now goes clear and he's going to try and win with Panache. But look at Quintana go after him. The man with the white jersey, the best young rider in the race. His first visit, he's hooked up with Chris Froome at one. 
one kilometre to go. Well, Quintana is looking for the victory. This was the move of Chris Furum just a few moments ago. The acceleration from the rear, and almost immediately when Rodriguez couldn't match it, Quintana comes straight out of his slipstream as well and right up to the yellow jersey. And remember, whichever one of these two win, Quintana is going now. If he wins the stage, he also wins the King of the Mountains. He also wins the best young rider, but he'll finish second in the Tour de France to Chris Froome. Well, we had said, Phil, since the very start, the first time we saw this man in the mountains, that he was a superb climber. And look at the way he's dancing away from everybody else. The first day we saw him riding in the Pyrenees, he misjudged it to the finish. He ran out of stamina. And why shouldn't he? at 23 years of age but now on the very last climb in the Alps he is showing us the talent he was born with in the high country of Colombia he's riding to the victory today he's riding to the king of the mountains he's riding to the best white jersey and he'll finish second tomorrow in Paris to this man well, uh, this man has done a lot, but he makes it so easy, 128 to uh, Quintana. He makes it look as if it's like just a walk in the park this afternoon. He will see that banner, and that banner is going to indicate to him six, 500 metres to go. 500 metres, half a kilometre of what has been one of the hardest journeys through the Alps in many, many years of the Tour de France. As he's cheered all the way up to the top of Semnoz now, the new face of the Tour as he's gone around that corner with ever such speed he's out of sight he's going to a lone victory he has tried every day to the mountains and this was his last shot and it's a success well the team had the confidence in this man right from the very get-go this morning they did all of the pacemaking they're leaving the yellow jersey to have his own moment on this mountain of Semnoz. They can take whatever time they can gain now. It will make no difference. Chris Froome has survived this last vital day in the Tour de France. This man at 23 is about to win his first ever stage in the Tour de France. And what a race for him, Paul. He wins with it the king of the mountains. He wins the white jersey as well. This little climber is one of the best climbers we've ever seen ride a bike. And let's not forget, Phil, uh, just in the way that Lucho Herrera came to the Tour de France, he stamped his authority all over the event, and second place at the end of the day tomorrow. He turns out to be one of the most popular riders. Uh, those in the know tip this man to likely win his first Tour. Well, he's just won his first stage, and he is the King of the Mountains. The race for the third-place podium finish is going to go to Joachim Rodriguez here in only his second Tour de France as he comes up now the clock is counting that's good enough for Quintana to finish second Rodriguez will finish third and the man who will win the Tour de France Chris Froome almost a smile on his face he's let the other two have their moment but he's the one who will stand on top of the podium on the Champs-Élysées tomorrow just 29 seconds uh, this man I think was very important in trying to set up the win for his teammate here this afternoon because this is Alejandro Valverde he's in fourth place on the road and I think he's going to move up a couple of places in the overall standings tonight well Al, this has been a great show you've got to feel sorry for Valverde he lost 10 minutes uh, in the crosswind when he had a broken wheel it was the time when Conta Conta Contador took time away from the yellow jersey a minute and nine seconds on that great day of racing this man lost 10 minutes but he stuck to his guns and he's come back into this Tour de France Alejandro Valverde finishes fourth on this crucial stage of the Tour well he wanted to finish on the podium and if it hadn't been for that bad day on the way down to Santa Mont when he had a bad time with a mechanical problem he could very well have been quite close to finishing on the podium the next rider to come up looking for fifth place will be Port, Contador and the American Andrew Talansky and just look at the gap here as Valverde comes up a minute and 38 seconds has passed by one minute 41 seconds for Valverde and it looks to me as though Richie Port has gone forward of the rest of that group and the man who has ridden alongside Chris Froome they are the best of mates they are personal friends because of their ability some say one day Richie Port will get the victory for Australia but today he's seen his team captain 
do the job and he still had the legs pulled to cross the line in fifth well he waited Phil till he could see that Contador was not going to be a threat to uh, the front end of the bike race anymore and he took his own freedom and got the last bit of energy out of his legs to cross the line in fifth now Andrew Chalansky, this young American from Florida, from Miami, has done the ride of his life in his first tour as well. Sixth place for him, and he'll climb up into a top ten finish in the tour. Well, that's a phenomenal performance. This is the young Frenchman, the man we'll talk about for the many years to come as well, Roman Bardet. He is also climbing up the overall standings tonight. Well, this lad's only 21 years of age. These are the new blood, the future of cycling in the Tour de France. Bardet, one day, might triumph for France. Now we see the loser of the day, that's Kreuzinger down there. Unfortunately, he might finish fifth, but the time gaps are incredible. Christophe uh, Reblon coming in. Well, what an amazing battle that was of Semnoz, and uh, I must say the organization found something very special here to end the climbs. There's the situation on the stage. Nero Quintana wins in 3.39. Rodriguez at 18 seconds. Fruma 29. Valverde at a minute 42. Richie Port getting away for fifth. Two minutes 17 seconds. Talansky only 2.27 back in sixth place. Contador 2.28. John Gadre was in eighth place. 2.48. Hernandez ninth and Kreuzinger in tenth. Roman Bardet, he finished at 3.01 in the 11th. Uh, looking further down, Nievi, who they tried to set the race up on Uskadel, he finished 13th. Uh, and Jan Bacalons, who stayed in the frame after he got the yellow jersey uh, right out at the beginning of the tour, comes across the line in 15th place. Right. Chris Froome, 5 minutes 3 seconds on Quintana. Rodriguez up into third place. Con Contador down second to fourth. Kreuzinger down fourth to fifth. The spread of eight minutes, ten seconds. Bauke Molimer, he maintains his sixth place. Fulsang keeps his seventh. Alessandro Valverde is eighth. Navarro went to swap places with Valverde. Uh, he, he's gone down to ninth. And Talansky has done it. He's claimed a top ten finish in the Tour de France tonight with a brilliant show of strength on the final climb of Semnos looking further down always a challenger throughout Queer Costi looks set to go home in 11th place Nieva he'll be in 12th Lawrence Tendam he's down to 13th further down Michael Rogers lost a lot of time yesterday and plunged from 8th and will looks like finishing now in 16th place Andy Schleck is in 20th and Richie Port there even though he's played the support for Froome is still going home in 19th This is a full-on bike race if you're a sprinter because everybody wants to win. Leaving the magical backdrop of the Chateau of Versailles behind, we go through the Valley de Chevreuse. Two King of the Mountains points in the Valley de Chevreuse, the Côte de Saint-Rémy de Chevreuse and the Côte de Château Four, before getting on to the hallowed cobblestones of the Champs-Élysées and then that circuit covered on seven occasions. Well, let's have a quick look at the profile because the profile, it's perfect if you're a sprinter. There are ten laps of seven kilometres at the end on the Champs-Élysées and this year, except they go right around the Arc de Triomphe at the top. I can't wait for them to get here because the sprint will be on. Uh, this is a royal start for sure for the Tour de France. As we pan around the gardens here of the Palace of Versailles, we are now waiting for the white flag to be pulled in for the last time by Christian Prudhomme, the race director of the Tour de France. Uh, the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Chris Froome for the very first time as a winner of the Tour de France. Well, a very fitting start as well, for Phil, because as they talk about the Chateau de Versailles, which was originally acquired by Louis XIII, but his son, Louis XIV, liked it so much, he built the castle here. And the newspapers this morning were talking about Chris Froome as being Le Roi Soleil, the King of the Sunshine. Well, I don't think we can argue with that just now. <laughs> So there's the riders below us. Once they start, I've got a feeling, Paul, we won't see a significant increase in pace like we have over the last 20 days of racing. The race was finished off yesterday, but that man in the white, Mark Cavendish, has never been beaten on the Champs-Élysées in the four years he's been finishing the Tour here. He's going to have a hard time today, though, Phil, because there are some fabulous sprinters uh, still left in the Tour de France this <laughs> afternoon. 
Well, this is uh, Purito is his nickname. That is uh, Joachim Rodriguez. He moved up into third place overall yesterday. What a change on the penultimate day of the Tour de France. Doesn't very often happen like that. The battle we saw yesterday was a really a battle royale, which is why I believe it's so fitting to start from Versailles this morning for the 100th edition of the Tour de France to come to a close. Last time we started from Versailles, it was a time trial, and uh, it led to the narrowest victory in the Tour de France. Just eight seconds in the end, separating the American Greg Le Monde from the Frenchman Laurent Fignon. He reversed the decision in the last time trial to the Champs-Élysées. And I think because it was so exciting, we've never had a time trial on the last day of the Tour de France since. But yesterday, I have to say, Paul, we had a wonderful battle on a hill we've never seen in the Tour before, which was the uh, mountain of Semnoz overlooking Annecy, right on the frontiers of Switzerland, and especially uh, the Swiss canton of Geneva. As we look at the riders down the Tuileries again, today's commercial free segment is brought to you by Schramm. And as the riders go down, they're coming up to the bell this time, and then we'll see this spectacular presentation. Well, of course, I haven't seen it. I'm only hearing what the French are telling us. It's going to be pretty good. And I'm sure anything attached to the Tour de France is, as we've seen over three weeks, pretty good. Looking at the sky over Paris now, it will be a full moon tonight as it looks down on the 100th Tour de France, going down the Tuileries, heading now to turn onto the Champs-Élysées, and the bell will celebrate the last lap of seven kilometres of the Tour de France. They still are now basically all together. Uh, check this out. It's going to be Richie Port from Sky leading Chris Froome onto the Champs-Élysées for this final lap. As they go around that corner, they can see the three riders... Just just in front of them it's only a second or two now they will be caught as they hear the bell that indicates one lap to go he's been rehearsing for that for a year I think we've got the message. It's the last lap there uh, as they all come back together again. There was a lot of rider with his hand up and he would be a lead out man for Dreipel and I think he's got a flat tyre. Well, that would be bad luck because it's all about the yes. lead out train there. You can see him swinging off there. This is a very hard, fast move now and you've got a lot of riders with white jerseys on and those are the riders from Argos Shimano. This is, looks like it's Geraint Thomas now making the pacemaking. He's grimacing. This is the guy whose mum did not want him to finish the tour of Franceville because she had a, he has a crack or he had a crack in his pelvis a slight hairline crack well interesting to see with Geron Thomas and the team of the yellow jersey driving this race into the last lap now that's not meant to be the way it is there's the hands up there by a lot of man now that's the lead out man or one of the lead out men for Andre Greipel remember that Marcel Kittel's team they lost Tom Beers a couple of days ago he's a lead out man this could be a very very interesting sprint because there are other riders in the Tour de France who have a fast finish as well well, Peter Sagan would really like to get this victory. Uh, just looking behind uh, Chris Froome, who is that? Well, I'll tell you who it is. It is Alberto Contador as well. Very soon, though, Phil, well, who was that that's gone uh, back? Yeah, it was uh, Jürgen Rollins who once broke his collarbone, uh, uh, badly damaged it in the Santos Tour Down Under. Well, that's, a, that's a useful man gone out for Greipel. It is. He's one of the big lead-out train, but now Lotto have decided they are going to get their lead-out man sorted out on the left-hand side of the road. The fourth rider there is, in fact, Andre Greipel. But look at the lead-out coming from the riders in the green. Well, look at this. The green are for the team of Peter Sagan. The men on the far left are for the team of Andre Greipel. And coming through in white are the team for Marcel Kittel. Well, don't forget Team Saxo Bank, Phil. Most people don't realise they've got a very good sprinter, Daniele Benati. That's why they've come to the front to do the pacemaking. He's been a great sprinter in the past. He rode for Radio Shack. Maybe they're going to try and look for something special on the final day. Don't forget, though, they are the team that will win the team classification. There's a come around the Place de l'Etoile for the last time. But I'm still waiting to see the pale blue jerseys of Omega Pharma Quickstep come forward to try and sort it out for Mark Cavendish. 
The years change in cycle racing that we only ever talked of one team when we used to come to these sprint finish. Now we can talk of four or five trains of different teams with sprinters on the end of them that can take out this stage of the Tour de France. As we place is on the same team, he wears a white jersey of champion of Poland, but that is Michael Kwiatkowski and he's turned out to be a great finisher as well. He's on Cavendish's team. So far so good, he's got his team lined up as we go down the tunnel. Just over on the left hand side you see the rider from Omega Pharma quick step he's done the turn on the front and now he just disappears he doesn't come now there's a move coming forward you've got uh, the, the Cannondale riders of Sagan trying to confuse the issue but you will not dissuade the men from Omega Pharma quick step from disorganizing their train they've got to keep the pressure high they've got to keep it stretched out into a long line so there isn't a grouping at the front end of the main field as Mark Cavendish's squad brings them out of the tunnel for the last time, Sagan is getting to mix up this. He's got it. He's only he's only got one teammate left, and the Sagan has gone onto the wheel of Mark Cavendish. Good choice as they go round Norwegian corner for the last time. Well, I think it's good choice if you want to get into second place because I don't think Sagan has got the kick to come round Mark Cavendish. This is Kwiatkowski, the man who has worn the leaders' jersey in the Best Young Rider competition. He's burying himself right now. Now the man right in front of Mark Cavendish there is Ger Stegman. He's a a great sprinter 1,000 meters to go third segment is the big man he's the last lead out man for Cavendish Cavendish is hooked up looking extremely determined watch out on the right though the third man in white down on the right is Marcel Kittel they've clashed before all the way around France particularly in San Malo it's three wins to Kittel so far two to Mark Cavendish and Sagan could spoil the party he's the only green jersey left Kittel has the ideal position right now and it's his teammates who are leading him right out now Cavendish has got to take a few risks as he goes around this final corner he He's got himself there into fourth position, Mark Cavendish. He's right on the wheel of Marcel Kittel. This is not going to be the normal lead out for him. As Kittel starts to move, Greipel is there. Cavendish is on Greipel's wheel. Remember that Cavendish had never been beaten here. Cavendish grits his teeth. He's on the outside of Greipel. I don't think he's going to get through this one as he comes up towards the line now. But he's kicking again and he hits the line. It is going to be desperately close, but they are saying he hasn't hit the line first. Well, that was an that unbelievable looks like Mar sprint. Marcel Kittel has lived a dream. It's the man in the middle there in the white jersey. If you look at Kittel, it's the lunge for the line. You talk about the wheel, best... Look at the bike at all over the road. The best three sprinters in the world, first, second and third, and the man who gets it. Look at this. Cavendish never really got going here. He didn't have the right lead out that he needs. He's trying to battle himself up alongside Greipel. Greipel's in a massive gear closest to the camera there. As you can see, the difference now. Kittel kicks again. He looks at the line. He holds it as hard as he can, but when they come up to the line there with that last lunge there's no chance at all Kittel is the fastest man but there is the winner of the Tour de France Sky for a second year have taken the winner to the line Chris Froome second last year is the winner of the Tour de France this time this boy who was born in Nairobi brought up in Johannesburg races for the UK has won the Tour de France in two years after drawing a blank for 98 editions of the Tour de France Great Britain has now won number 99 and number 100. And that man there really dominated it. Well, this is the moment, and don't forget the presentation will be almost immediately here. Chris Froome, he's lived his dream this last uh, He's held the jersey for 14 days, two weeks of the three-week race. He's relied on all of his team, particularly the rider on the right from Tasmania in Australia. Richie Port, one day, might win the Tour de France for himself. Rider alongside him there, uh, David Lopez. And how pretty is that as we look over to the Jardin de Tuilier. There's a great Ferris wheel, and you can see Paris is starting to light up. Thank you.
Well, just take a look at the sprint here as they head to the line. Mark Cavendish uh, doesn't seem to be quite as fast as he has been previously because Marcel Kittel's boys are bringing their man home for a fourth stage win of this year's Tour de France. Kittel made the run. Greipel tried to get on his wheel. Cavendish was already at full stretch. That's not happened in the last four visits to the Champs-Élysées. His bike is actually bouncing all over the stones. You can hardly hold it down there. And in the end, he was wasn't even close because Marcel Kittel won the first stage of the Tour de France this year, won the last stage of the Tour de France. He has had an absolutely incredible ride around this country. Two to Cavendish, four to Kittel, and one to Greipel is the score on this Tour de France. Saga now, the show has started. The Eiffel Tower is twinkling in the sky as darkness falls, and look at the Arc de Triomphe. You can see the clock counting down to the ceremonies. Paris salutes the 100th Tour de France. to admit, Phil, they've made something very, very special here for this 100th edition. When this all began in 1903, no one could have imagined this is how it would be 110 years later. Spectacular opening now to the 100th Tour de France celebrations, the presentations to the premier winners. And to the podium, Marcel Kittel, what a winner, what a day to win his fourth stage of the Tour de France in his second appearance. This is one day Marcel Kittel will never ever forget as he climbs up, uh, he is the first presentation here this afternoon. And I have to say, he must be uh, remembering, he will remember all of this for the rest of his life. Marcel Kittel. And Marcel Kittel is winning this year his 15th win, and that's more than anybody else this season. Saxo Bank Tinkoff, he changed ownership this team race six times before it finally came back to the shoulders of Saxo Tinkoff. Alberto Contador's team still smiles on the left there even though he faded from second in the Tour de France to finally finish in fourth. Well you've got to say Phil, this is the Champs-Elysees as you have never ever seen it before. Maillot vert de Green Jersey, présenté par Pierre, présenté par Pierre. Let's not forget that uh, Peter Sagan is the defending champion of the Green Jersey points competition. Took the competition last year with uh, three stage victories. This year only a single stage victory, but he was certainly the most consistent rider through the whole of this three weeks. There he is, and he receives his presentation, Phil, from the uh, Slovakian uh, Republic ambassador. He actually defends his jersey, so he gets to keep his green jersey. This was initially the aim of Mark Cavendish, but uh, Sagam is just too consistent. Slovakia. 
Supervi, il a remporté la septième étape, Montpellier Albi. You won the seventh stage, Montpellier Albi. Pide Saga. On doit vous entendre un peu plus fort que ça autour des coureurs pour cette centième édition. Merci d'être avec nous. So moving on now to the King of the Mountains and this will be for the real find of this year's Tour de France after Chris Froome was a great favourite anyway. But this is for the polka dot jersey and he won it yesterday on the very last mountain when he won the stage there. Twenty-three years of age, Phil Nairo Quintana has proved that he is a fabulous climber. Winner a couple of years ago in 2010 of the, the apprenticeship Tour de France, if you like, the Tour de l'Avenir. But taking that victory on the final big climb of the Tour de France must be very, very special. His presentation is from the ambassador of Colombia, Gustavo Adolfo Carvajal. Twenty-three years of age, we'll see a lot of him now. He completes his first Tour de France in second place overall. Well, they have to quickly lift the polka dot jersey off his shoulder because they're now going to present him with the white jersey. There he is back up on the podium. He's handed off his polka dot jersey. It's all happened in one stage win yesterday in Semnoz. And he's won a total of $361,000 after that ride yesterday with all the prizes he picked up. He's already told us during our program he comes from a poor background where money was not, uh, was not too much around. Now he's won $361,000. And his career at 23 is only just beginning. What a triumph uh, twinkles in the evening light here in Paris in yellow as Chris Froome becomes the champion of the 100 Tour de France. Now it's a time to relax. No tomorrow morning, no attacks in the mountains. He has won the tour. Just have a check of that jersey there, Phil. The jersey itself is sparkling, just as the Arc de Triomphe is too. And he won't really understand what's happened to him until tomorrow or the next day or next week. But tonight, he can just savour the pleasure. He'll be joined now by the riders he's battled with throughout the Tour de France. Stay with us. Stay there. Stay on the podium. He's being told to stay. Nairo Quintana and Joachim Rodriguez. Third place from Spain and Katusha, Joaquim Rodriguez. What a battle to think for that podium that was only decided last night, just over 24 hours ago. The vainqueur and the winner from Sky and Great Britain, Chris Froome.
A dominant champion, Chris Froome. He wins by five minutes plus. And uh, there's Michelle. She's got a few of those little lines. As pleasant. They get one every day. They take a yellow jersey. Chris Froome has got 14 yellow jerseys. And he's being offered the microphone now to say the what's now become a traditional few words to the crowd. And he has prepared something. I'd like to thank all of the supporters who came to this edition of the Tour de France. It was an exceptional tour with a battle right up until the end. I'd like to dedicate this win to my late mother. Without her encouragement to follow my dreams, I'd probably never probably be at home watching this event on TV. It's a great shame she never got to come see the tour, but I'm sure she'd be extremely proud if she was here tonight. This, this amazing journey would have not been possible without the support I've received on and off the bike. I'd like to thank my teammates, who have buried themselves day in, day out, throughout this tour to keep this yellow jersey on my shoulders. And the Team Sky management for believing in my ability and building this team around me. Thank you to all the people who have taken their time to teach and mentor me over the years to get me into this privileged position. Finally, I'd like to thank my close friends and family who have been there for me every step of the way, especially to my fiance Michelle, who's here tonight. This is a beautiful country with the finest annual sporting event on the planet. To win the 100th edition is an honor beyond any I've dreamed. This is one yellow jersey that will stand the test of time. Thank you.